Chapter 20 Jason looked at the digital readout on the sedative injector in his right hand. One dose left. The two captives had received enough of the drug to keep a small gang of men down for a week, and still they could move, though not much given how tightly the Nogri had bound them. Just how tough the Yuzhan Vong's creations were slammed into him, along with bloody visions of a long war against them. He turned from the back end of the best chance, sidled past where Ganner sat with a reddened pressure bandage against his face, and slipped out the hatch. Jason crossed quickly to where Corin stood talking to Raid. He nodded to the both of them, but waited for their conversation to end before he said anything. The Garkian smiled wearily. I appreciate the offer, Corin, but I'm not going to take up one of those open slots you have on the ship. I can't abandon my people, and they'd refuse in order to evacuate. We're here for the long haul. I'm not being altruistic here, Raid. You've got great intel on the Vong, and we need it. But what you need more is us being active here, making the Yuzhan Vong think the whole Zena Botanical Garden fire was just a terrorist act. The resistance leader clapped the elder Jedi on the shoulders. Your coming here meant a lot and we'll get more information out to you. You have to go so you can find a way to turn our people back into our people. We need to be here to make sure there are some folks remaining to welcome the returnees back. Corin's green eyes narrowed. You're not being abandoned, you know. We'll be back to liberate Garky. Raid's smile broadened. Better hurry back. We're planning to do the job ourselves. Jason held up the injector. Our guests are down, but I'm not sure for how long. There's one dose left. Can I give it to Ganner? Did he ask for it? The young man shook his head. He's suffering, though. Corin thought for a moment, then nodded. Ask him if he wants it. If he says no, give it to him anyway. Are you joking? Corin shook his head. He's a Jedi, and he's in pain. I don't want him twitching TK that breaks something. We can't go until we get a signal, and I want us ready to sky when that happens. Our escape window here isn't going to be that big. The idea that he should shoot Ganner full of a sedative against his will struck Jason as a gross violation of Ganner's privacy and dignity, and he almost suspected Corin gave him the directive because of the friction between the two older Jedi. But Corin's reasoning made perfect sense, and his deliberation before telling Jason what to do suggested he was searching for any way around adding insult to Ganner's injury. The order, though it would be a blow to Ganner, would be for the sake of the mission. Clearly Ganner's wishes, or those of anyone else, had to be secondary to what they were doing. Just as I should have left the courtyard when Corin ordered me to, regardless of the consequences. All of a sudden, Jason saw the role of a mission leader in an entirely different light. Before, he'd always seen the leader as someone in power, and he could see how that position would be desirable. It meant a person had to be deemed superior to his fellows. His orders were to be followed. His dictates were law. For someone as young as he was, becoming a leader seemed like a promotion to adult status and he had not looked beyond that point. The other side of being the leader and what that meant blossomed full in his brain. Yes, Corin could give orders, but he bore the full responsibility for the consequences of those actions. The success or failure of the mission was on his shoulders entirely. Jason had no doubt that if required to, Corin would order suicidal assaults. The stand at the garden had been one such, and even though such orders could be justified in the name of success, Corin would still have to live with the consequences of his orders. And Uncle Luke, too. Jason turned back toward the ship and re-entered. His uncle had an even greater burden to bear, and Jason was suddenly relieved that such a mantle did not rest on his shoulders. Not only was it bone-crushing, but Jason was fairly certain that having to shoulder it would deflect him from discovering the sort of Jedi he should become. 
responsibility for others could blind me to my responsibility within the force. He ducked his head and passed through the hatchway. He smiled at Ganner. Corin said I can give you this last dose of sedative if you want it. No, I don't need it. Jason nodded, then stabbed it toward Ganner's thigh. The injector got within five centimeters, then stopped as if he'd been trying to drive it through transparasteel. Ganner glared at him. Don't make me break the injector, Jason. If he can focus that much, he's not going to be twitching. Sorry, Corin said. Corin said what he had to say. I don't want a sedative. Not yet, anyway. Ganner turned his head and glanced at one of the Nogri. Sirka, your help, please. The Nogri unbuckled himself from his seat. Ask! The med pack has a Nylar field cauterizer. Ganner peeled the bandage away from his face. Use it to close the wound. The Nogri nodded and bent to retrieve the med pack from beneath Ganner's seat. He slid it out and opened it. From the box he drew a sixteen-centimeter-long stylus that emitted a close-focus, low-frequency laser beam that would burn the wound shut. The Nogri stood again, and for the first time Jason realized that some of the patterning on the Nogri's gray flesh was from scars, some of which he felt certain Sirka had closed himself with a cauterizer. Wait a minute. Jason held a hand up. The wound on Ganner's face ran from above his left eye, splitting the brow, down to his cheekbone and below, to his jawline. Blood bubbled in the lower part of the wound as Ganner breathed, and the amphistaph had clearly carved bone as it slashed his face. Wait for what? We'll get out of here. You can get into a bacta tank. If he uses that thing, you'll have a scar. I imagine I will. Ganner looked at the Nogri. You don't have to be fancy. Just close the wound. The Nogri nodded and reached out to pinch Ganner's flesh together. He stroked the cauterizer against the wound's seams, sending little puffs of white smoke into the air. The bittersweet scent of burning flesh got into Jason's nose, and he couldn't snort it back out. As much as he wanted to walk away, though, he couldn't do that either. Ganner gripped the arms of the seat, and his muscles tightened with every brush of the cauterizer. Jason could feel some pain coming off him, but it was considerably less than the disgust that rolled off the injured Jedi. It seemed to Jason almost as if with each touch of the cauterizer... Ganner was reliving the cut that had opened the wound. Don't worry, Ganner. You won't be fooled by one of them again. Ganner said nothing until Sirka dropped to a knee and began working on the wound on Ganner's thigh. The Jedi accepted a dressing soaked in disinfectant and swabbed it over the side of his face, clearing up the blood. Most of the red went away, save the angry line from forehead to jaw. The flesh on the line was clearly tender, but Ganner washed it thoroughly nonetheless. You don't understand, Jason. The Yuzhan Vong didn't fool me. I fooled myself. Ganner closed his eyes for a moment and sat back. He opened only his right eye. Throughout this mission, since I first heard of the Yuzhan Vong even, I wanted to prove that I was better than they were. I was furious that I did not get to engage a Vong on Dimiel. The first one I killed this afternoon, I tricked into stepping into that hole. I knew he was a fool, and he died because of his stupidity. And somehow I started thinking that I was a genius compared to the rest of them. Little wisps of white smoke rose like a curtain between Ganner and Jason as the Nogri closed the other flesh wound. It wasn't a stretch for me to think I was brilliant compared to the Yuzhan Vong. I've been thinking that for a long time compared to other Jedi. Your uncle, Corin, Cam, all of them. They aren't of our generation of Jedi. They knew the Empire. They fought it or served it. They are older. They don't know the Force the way we do. Didn't have the training we did. He nodded his thanks to the Nogri as Sirka put the cauterizer away. Krog Val made me pay for my arrogance in a way none of the others had. They could have. 
Your uncle could have broken me down. Corin could have been nastier. But I took their being nice as a sign of weakness. I mean, I teased Corin's son. I was being an idiot, and Corin endured it because the mission we were given was more important than his feelings. Ganner sighed. So yes, I'll have a scar. And it will be good. The old Ganner, he had a perfect face over a perfectly arrogant attitude. Not so anymore. Every time I look in a mirror, I'll be reminded that he died on Garki. And I'm here in his place. The cold edge to Ganner's voice sent a chill through Jason. He wanted to protest that Ganner didn't need a ruined face to remind him of the sort of person he should be. Jason couldn't bring himself to speak. As we grow up, we change physically. Maybe Ganner needs this change, not to remind him of who he should be, but as a mark of who he has become. My uncle lost a hand doing that. What will happen to me? Ganner sighed. Now, if you wouldn't mind... Jason blinked. What? Sedative. I'll take it now. Jason frowned. But you could have had it before to make all that easier. I didn't want it to be easier, Jason. Wanted it to be memorable. He smiled, then closed his eyes. Wake me when we're safe again. Jason touched the injector to him and pumped a full dose of sedative into Ganner. Jason smiled as the man relaxed. Let's just hope, Ganner, that there will be a point when we're safe again. Wedge Antilles stood with Admiral Crefe on the Raal Roost's bridge. They both stared at the forward viewport and the system's brilliant spot that was Garky. It seemed so far away, yet a simple jump through hyperspace could carry the ship there in an instant, and might carry us into an ambush. Wedge slowly shook his head. Think they're waiting for us? The Bothan Admiral shrugged uneasily. There is still a great deal we don't know about them, Wedge. We know that when we send a message from here to Garki, it will take three and a quarter standard minutes to reach our people on the ground. We don't know if the Yuzhan Vong have means by which they can communicate faster. The message that came in from Corin requesting a pickup was sent over twelve hours ago. The Yuzhan Vong could have reacted to their operation and have summoned support. Sith spawn. We don't even know if the Yuzhan Vong travel through hyperspace the way we do, or if they are faster than our ships are. Nor do we know how close they are to Garki, or what their possible response time could be. We live and learn. Crefe flashed fangs as he smiled. If we live, we learn. Without looking back, he growled a question. Sensors! No anomalous system readings! No, Admiral. All is within normal limits. Fine gravitational fluctuation readings do not indicate any increased mass hiding around moons or asteroid belts. If the Yuzhan Vong are hiding ships out there, they must be very tiny. Thank you, Sensors. The Bothan turned and nodded to a dark-furred officer at the communications console. Lieutenant Araka, send a message to Colonel Horn. Tell him we are here to pick him up. Request transmission of his intelligence reports as he comes up. Deploy a communications relay drone here to capture and send out the report in case we have trouble. As ordered, Admiral. The snowy Bothan then looked over at Tico Selchu at the Flight Operations Command Center. Colonel, if you would be so kind as to put our fighters on alert. Done, Admiral. Crefe came full around, his eyes narrowing. It would seem a decision to advance would be difficult, but it's really not. We made a bargain with Horn and his people. They go into danger. We get them out. I will uphold that bargain. I think you should, though others may question your judgment if the Vong are waiting for us. Wedge gave the Bothan a grim grin. But then, hindsight criticism, 
is always based on fantasy foresight. What we should have known will be touted as facts we chose to overlook. If you think I'm overlooking anything, do let me know. Yes, Admiral, I will. Wedge nodded toward Garky. Right now, the only thing I want to overlook is Garky's horizon and see a ship coming up to greet us. I agree. Helm, execute primary egress vector plot. Look alive, people. We have heroes to rescue. Jaina Solo, locked in the cockpit of her X-Wing, didn't so much feel the micro-jump into the interior of the Garky system as much as she picked up sensations of uneasiness from crew members who didn't like making jumps. As those impressions faded, she immediately got a launch authorization and jammed her throttle full forward. The fighter jetted down the launch tube and shot out beneath the belly of the raw roost, between it and Garky's spinning sphere. She brought her X-Wing up on Annie Capstan's port side and began to orbit. Sparky, sensors at full. Filter for Vong flight characteristics. The droid tootled an acknowledgment of the order. Jaina resisted the urge to reach out through the force to sense her brother. She'd been stung by the deception earlier, when the task force had been inserted into Garki. Intellectually, she understood the need for operational security, and she could remember the shock of everyone on board the Rall Roost when the task force was believed dead. Gavin had been correct about the tragedy and subsequent revelation creating a sense of unity between the crew and the pilots. Not knowing made them all one and using the Force now would violate that trust. The latest briefing did say they had casualties, including a Jedi. She knew it wasn't her brother. No matter the distance from her twin, she felt certain she would know if he'd died, and she did acknowledge there was a huge difference between casualty and fatality. But somewhere in the back of her mind, she'd imagined Jedi were somehow special, and not the sort of heroes to fall in combat. Logically, and based on even the most recent history of the Jedi, she knew that wasn't true. But the depiction of heroism in the Jedi tradition allowed her to accept the fantasy as true on an emotional level. Right now, the only possibility you should be dwelling on is vaping some Vong so the best chance can make it home. She checked her sensors, but they remained clean. Nothing here, Lead. Annie Capstan, her wingmate, reported on the squadron tactical frequency. Twelve here. I have one contact coming up from Garky. Looks like our people. Good. Stand by. Gina was about to ask Sparky to punch up Annie's contact when the droid shrieked. Her primary sensor monitor lit up with one huge contact, then several smaller ones, all of which began leaking yet smaller contacts. She looked up through her cockpit canopy and her mouth went bone dry. Emperor's black bones! The Yuzhan Vong had arrived, and in force. Chapter 21 Corin Horn headed the best chance straight for the Ral Roost, and was happy to see X-Wings pouring from the Bothan ship. A smile lit his face. He keyed the ship's comm system. There it is. We're all but home. He heard a little gasp from Jason and felt a burst of shock roll off the younger man. Look at this. Corin, we've got problems. Thanks for the preview, Jason. Now count it off for me. He put enough of an edge in his voice to get Jason to concentrate. How much, what, and where? Sorry, Corin. Jason exhaled curtly. I have one big contact, seven smaller ones, and then skips all over the place. At least sixty-four, but more coming all the time. Small contacts are corvette size. The big one is a Yuzhan Vong cruiser. They are vectoring in at our aft. Their closure rate means they'll get us before we get to the raw roost. Thanks, I think. Corin flicked the comm unit over to the tactical frequency for the Bothan assault cruiser. This is best chance calling Rall Roost. We can break off and go dirt side. You get clear. Negative best chance. Keep coming. Corin recognized Admiral Crefe's voice. 
With all due respect, sir, there's an asteroid belt's worth of Vong here. We are not worth risking the roost for. Your humility notwithstanding, Colonel Horn, I'm the one who makes the decisions here. You come to us as fast as you can. The Bothan Admiral paused for a second. This possibility was not wholly unanticipated. Ensconced in his cabin aboard the Burning Pride, with the cognition hood linking him to the ship's sensory apparatus, Dane Leon let the first shock of finding New Republic forces at Garki roll off him. He had proposed to Shadow Shai an expedition to Garki, ostensibly to check up on how Krog Val was doing with the slave conversion experiment. He intended, based on reports from his own agents in the Garki garrison, to show that resistance had not been wiped out there, shaming Krog Val and bringing his master's judgment into question. Shadow Shai had granted the request for the trip, but demanded that Dane take a large task force with him. Dane's inquiries as to why he should do it had been met with a withering stare. He'd acquiesced to the request because he knew it was a gross waste of resources, which would not look good for Shadow Shai. And yet somehow he knew. Dane Leon shivered, then focused. The ship's sensors brought to him a holographic feel for the system and ships. His training allowed him to pick out the prize— the one ship running from Garki and his forces, the one ship to which the infidels were sending their fighters. As fast as he could think it, the order went out. His forces oriented on the small ship racing away from Garki. Get it. Kill it. Then kill all the rest of them. On the bridge of the Ral Roost, Admiral Crefe turned away from the viewport as the blast shields began to close. He strode over to the communications station with deliberate haste, but not a whiff of anxiety. He smiled at the Bothan sitting there. Lieutenant, please invite Hammer Group to take up the positions outlined in Delta Case. As ordered, Admiral. As she punched up the appropriate tactical frequencies and began to relay orders, Crefe turned to Wedge. Nasty little game to be played here. Our reinforcements should be useful, but they're not going to be enough. We're not trying to win the battle wedge, just trying to win some time. Crefe pointed toward his station on the bridge. Sensors, give me a holographic feed of the system, and start relaying all our tactical data out to Coruscant through the drone we left at the edge of the system. Setting it up now, Admiral. Good. Very good. He let a predatory grin slowly spread over his face. A low growl rumbled from his throat, summoning up a very fundamental piece of his Bothan psyche. It was something he set aside when dealing with humans, for they so often saw the malevolent side of it in Bothan politics. We are predators by nature, and now I need that nature. Remain here with me, Wedge Antilles. Crefe's words rolled out in low tones, borne deep in his chest. We might not be able to kill the Yuzhan Vong here, but we can hurt them. And that might just be enough. Jaina kicked her X-wing up into a portside barrel roll then came around for a long glide to starboard. She stayed hot on Annie's port wing, the two of them angling in for a series of deflection shots on a skip squadron. Ready when you are, Twelve. Annie double-clicked her comm, acknowledging Jaina's comment. The pair of them adjusted their course, drifting a little more starboard, then closed on a knot of six ships jetting in at the best chance. In a flash of blue fire, a proton torpedo launched from Annie's X-Wing. A heartbeat later, a second missile raced from the starfighter. Jaina's eyes narrowed. If this works... The first proton torpedo approached the group of skips, and the Yuzhan Vong fighters responded by putting up voids to catch the missile before it could hit the fighters. Using a tactic that had proved effective in the fighting on Dantooine... The New Republic had programmed the proton torpedo 
to detonate prematurely when it detected a gravitic anomaly, which this missile did. The skips then found themselves on a course heading straight for a titanic cloud of energy. This shattered the formation. The Yuzhan Vong pilots broke like birds in flight, twisting their ships about at acute angles. Some flew below, and others turned toward the attack. One pair broke away and up, and therein proved the efficacy of the new tactic. The one flaw in the coral skipper design was that the dove-in basils that manipulated gravity waves to provide propulsion also were the things that generated the voids. The New Republic analysts had noted that when voids were generated, the ability of skips to maneuver was diminished. It took rogue squadrons' pilots to realize that the reverse might also be true. The second proton torpedo caught up with two of the fleeing skips and exploded. One skip vanished amid the brilliant detonation. The other caught a part of the blast on its port side, melting the Yorick coral and exposing the cockpit to vacuum. The stony ship stopped flying with any direction or purpose and just tumbled toward Garky like so much other interstellar debris. Jaina dropped her aiming reticle on the closest Yuzhan Vong fighter and hit the splinter shot trigger. Her quadded lasers spat out hundreds of underpowered laser darts at her target. A small void absorbed some of them, but quickly collapsed, allowing other shots to pepper the fighter's rocky exterior. The second she saw splinters getting through, she hit the main trigger, loosing a full quad burst on the fighter. The sizzling crimson bolts converged on the ship, filling the nose with enough energy to make it glow white-hot. Molten stone peeled back, sloughing off like dead flesh. The skip began a slow roll, then shook and jerked, thrashing as the Dovin basils died. Annie clipped off a quick shot that damaged the other skip, but didn't kill it, and then she and Jaina were through to the other side of the Yuzhan Vong formation. Watching the sensors intently, Jaina brought her X-wing around for another run. Above her, the battle had deteriorated, with skips and X-wings spinning and looping, streaking and rolling in a chaotic tangle. The proton torpedo tactic that proved so useful in the first pass would now have as much chance of taking out an ally as an enemy. We're back to conventional tactics. Beyond the fighters, the capital ships had begun to slug it out. The Ral Roost's two companion ships, a pair of Victory-class Star Destroyers, appeared above and beyond the Yuzhan Vong cruiser. They launched barrages of concussion missiles and laced the enemy formation with turbo-laser fire. The corvette-sized Yuzhan Vong ships intercepted many of the missiles and shots before they could reach the cruiser, providing an outer sphere of defense. Their shots back at the New Republic forces were picked up by shields, but those shields could not hold forever. Jaina felt a shiver run down her spine. Were this a sim, it would be obvious that we're overmatched. It would be time to cut and run. She sighed. It's not a sim. We can't run. We can't win. So we just have to hope we hurt them enough that they don't really win either. Deep in the bowels of his ship, Dane Leon smiled. The advent of the New Republic reinforcements had surprised him but a quick study of the situation showed that their intervention would only extend the time it took to kill them. While his coral skippers had taken more damage than he expected they would, and the new ships had deployed more mechanical fighters, his fighter force still outnumbered the enemy. Likewise, his capital ships outnumbered them and were more powerful. He directed all his attacks at one of the smaller New Republic ships, the cannons on the Yuzhan Vong ships vomited plasma bolts at it, hammering the shields. The enemy ship's sphere of protection began shrinking. Another volley or two and the shields would collapse. Then the shots would melt their way through the enemy vessel, ridding it of its blasphemous parody of life. And when that is done, I take the rest of them. The Yuzhan Vong leader smiled slowly. Forces will praise me for winning. My position will be such that when my master falters, there will be but one choice for his replacement. 
Admiral Gilad Pelion, seated in the chair from which Grand Admiral Thrawn had commanded the Chimera, watched the holographic display of the battle raging at the heart of the Garki system. He smoothed his mustache with the thumb and forefinger of his left hand, then stabbed his right index finger down on the command chair's comm button. Is Force Spike deployed? Guns? His combat command officer replied affirmatively. Confirmed now, Admiral. Good. Helm, five seconds to jump. Positions from Gammaphile. Tell Spike Lead he is cleared to jump to point Blood Niner. As ordered, Admiral. Pelion released the comm button and sat back, pressing his hands together. For decades, he had dreamed of finding a new Republic task force in such a compromising position. He would plan out an ambush as he had done here, then order it executed. He smiled as he imagined their surprise. Oh, they will still be surprised, I imagine. He nodded slowly. As will our targets. Corin whipped the best chance through a roll, then brought the nose up in a half loop before inverting and rolling out to port and diving. His sensors still showed two skips on his ship's tail. His maneuvers were keeping them from getting good shots in on him, but the Yuzhan Vong were slowly herding him away from the Ral Roost. Jason, any more sedative in that injector? Ganner took the last of it. Why? Well, I always kind of figured I'd like to die in my sleep. Corin laughed aloud. Just so you know, kid, you've impressed me on this mission. Might not mean much when we're free-floating atoms, but... Ship spawn! Didn't think that comment warranted profanity. No, Corin. Multiple new contacts coming in. I have two Star Destroyers, one Imp class and another Vic, and a bunch of something else. ID transponders list them as Imperial Remnant forces. Corin smiled. Let them know we're friendly, Jason. Then hang on. We might just get out of this after all. Sparky screeched as dozens of tactical fighter contacts sprayed themselves over Jaina's aft sensor screens. She broke to port in a barrel roll and glanced down at her monitor. The craft looked like nothing she had ever seen before. It had a TIE Fighter ball cockpit, with the twin ion engine pod at the back of it. Unlike TIEs, though, this one had four arms emerging from the junction of engine and pod. They jutted out and forward, as if fingers closing on the cockpit, splaying out in an array that was faintly reminiscent of an X-Wing's laser positioning for combat. A sharp keening peeled through her comm unit, then resolved itself into a human voice. "'Get clear, rogues!' They are ours now. Spike lead out. What? Who? Gina's jaw dropped open as the claw-like fighters blasted past her. Three sets of four, all grouped in tight formations. They twisted and turned as if the pilots shared a brain, moving with precision that took her breath away. Their weapons blazed out with green splinter shots, then loosed paired bolts that hit the skips with incredible accuracy. Cockpits became volcanoes. Dovin basils boiled and exploded. Skips crumbled as the thirty-six claw craft that had just appeared in the system raked their way through the dogfight. The two star destroyers that had at the same time appeared shifted the balance of the capital ship battle. One interposed itself between the enemy and the stricken Tanab sunrise. Its shields had collapsed, and a dozen fires burned in holes in the hull. The new Victory-class Star Destroyer, Red Harvest, soaked off incoming fire from the Yuzhan Vong, while using its weapons to crush one of the enemy corvettes. The other one, the Chimera, joined the Ral Roost in targeting the Yuzhan Vong cruiser. The enemy vessel spawned a plague of gravitic anomalies. They managed to absorb the assaults directed at it, but killed all maneuvering capability from the ship. It can hold us off like this until the Dovin Basil's tire and we have no idea how long that will be. Rogue leader to all rogues. Recall is ordered. Back to the roost. We have achieved our objective, and we're heading home. Gina blinked, then stretched out with the force. She felt her brother's presence, safe and whole on the raw roost. Now if we can just get back, 
She glanced at her sensor screens and frowned. The skip traces were few and far between, and all heading toward the Yuzhan Vong cruiser. The clawcraft wove intricate patterns through what had been the battleground, with quartets of them escorting X-wings back to the Bothan ship. One small formation curled down and came around, taking up a position around Jaina and Annie. Don't worry, rogues, we have you now. We'll get you home safely. The patronizing tone in Spike Leader's voice made Jaina grit her teeth. Who are you? We're simply the best combat pilots in the galaxy. A momentary spark of static burst through the comm channel. We are a Chiss House phalanx, on loan to the New Republic by my father, General Baron Suntir Fell. Chapter 22 What Shadow Shai saw on the surface of Garki did not please him. Coming down to the planet in a shuttle, he had seen a blackened scar below but standing amid it magnified its obscenity. Charcoal crunched beneath his feet. The dry scent of burned wood filled his nostrils, and occasionally a hint of charred flesh made it through as well. Pleased that the mask he wore hid his shock and disgust, Shadow Shai looked down at the subordinate who lay prostrate before him. He carefully placed his foot on his inferior's neck. You say, Runk Das, that Krag Val fought valiantly here before dying. How is it that you did not die with him? Runk spit cinders from his mouth. Commander, Krag Val ordered this one to remain behind, preserving information for you, guarding against a different attack by the Resistance. I wanted to be here to guard him. But I had been ordered to remain behind. Dane Leon snorted from Shadow Shai's left. Obey a foolish order, and you merely reveal yourself to be a complete and total fool. The Yuzhan Vong leader's left hand snapped out. Stiffened fingers slapped against Leon's throat, punching a coughed gasp from him. The subordinate staggered back a step and began to bring his hands up to his throat. They stopped halfway, curling down into fists, then loosened again and slowly drifted back to his sides. Leon dropped to one knee and bowed his head. Your pardon, master. Shadow Shai regarded Leon coldly, then returned his gaze to the Yuzhan Vong beneath his foot. What happened here? Tell me all. Runk's fingers clawed into the ground. We can only surmise, and only have information from some Chazrak who ran from here. And what you surmise is? A grey tongue licked lips free of black specks. Krog Val, as is proper announced a challenge to the enemy leader. Silverblade did not answer it. Yellowblade did. Then one of the others, not a Jedi, answered. Krog Val cut down the first. Then Yellowblade. The third Jedi slew him. Silverblade engaged others and must have slain them. Our slaves broke and ran. The enemy burned this place to the ground consuming the bodies of their dead and ours. Shadow Shai's right hand convulsed into a fist. He pounded it against his armored thigh, breaking the grip and letting each finger slowly straighten. And by the time you got here, the conflagration had spread. You could find no way to track them? No, leader. There was nothing we could do. Wrong, Runk of Domain Das. Shadow Shai shifted all of his weight onto the subordinate's neck, then twisted his foot, popping skull from spine. You could have been faster. He glanced quickly at Dane Leon. His subordinate hesitated, then started to lower himself to the ground. Don't be stupid, Dane Leon. 
the Yuzhan Vong leader left Runk's body twitching out its life and stood over his aide. What have you learned from letting your prey escape? Dane Lian's eyes studied the blackened ground. That the infidels are cunning. They laid a trap for us. Had you not insisted... Shadow Shai kicked him in the chest, dumping him onto his left flank in a black cloud of dust. If that is the lesson you learned, you are no smarter than Runk. But, my leader, think, Lian. Truly think. Shadow slowly spread his gauntleted hands. You see this ruin around you. And you come away with an impression of cunning? Analyze the battle you were involved in. The truth is obvious. I have tried, Commander. Not hard enough, Lian. Shadow suppressed a shiver spawned by his subordinates' incompetence. They arrive and deploy to recover the Jedi. You arrive and deploy to deny them their prize. Your force is superior. Then they bring in reinforcements in two waves. The second wave's delay gained them no tactical advantage. One of their ships took serious damage because of the delay. Moreover, given where the second wave appeared in the system... There are a limited number of points from which they could have come. Few of them allow for convenient access to the New Republic. But not so, this Imperial Remnant. The Yuzhan Vong leader slowly paced a circle around his aide. More importantly, even the arrival of this force was not enough to defeat you and drive you away from the planet. They took their prize and retreated. My supposition is that the second wave was from the Imperial Remnant, here for their own reasons, and they decided to intervene. Lian nodded slowly. My leader's wisdom is boundless. If it were that, I would have sent more ships with you. I would have been here myself. The aide looked up. How did you know to send ships with me? Shadow Shai paused for a moment. The earlier appearance of the New Republic ship made no sense. If they wished a scouting run on Garki, it could have remained at the system fringe while their fighters flew in close, gathered data, and retreated. This was largely their activity pattern at Cernpedal. The only reason for them to be here was to deliver the ship that was reported downed. Analysis of the crash site showed us all we would expect. I failed to see... Indeed! Shadow Shai snorted. You and those who explored the ruins of the ship. They were so afraid of being tainted that they missed the obvious. Why would we find traces of the crew of a stricken ship when they could get into escape pods? But there were no indications of life pods. Exactly. There were none. The Yuzhan Vong leader rubbed his hands together. Now we know the escape ship was hidden in the downed one. The biotrace material merely bait. It was an elaborate ruse. But why... Lian, how can you be so stupid? Shadow Shai opened his arms. We are standing amid their reason. Go now and determine what that reason was. Find out why they destroyed this place. Those who fell here demand it of you. Do not fail them or me. As you command, Master. Shadow Shai turned his back on Lian and waited for the sound of his aide's footsteps to fade to nothingness before he turned around again to regard his silent golden shadow. 
And what do you make of this destruction, Alegos? The Kamasi shrugged with his full body. This was a garden. It had no military value. They were pursued here, made a stand. Collateral damage. The Yuzhan Vaughn let a little chuckle roll from his throat. You think me fooled so easily? Do you think I seek to fool you? Alegos's dark eyes remained wide open and innocent. If Dane Leon cannot figure out why this place was burned, despite the time he has now spent here, how am I to know with only an hour's inspection? Shadow Shai began to walk deeper into the scorched scar, then waved his right hand to indicate Alegos should accompany him. When the alien caught up, he glanced at him. How is it you abide their company, Alegos? You are thoughtful and peaceful. They are neither. I see it here. I saw it at your world of Bimiel. How do you stand being with such dishonorable creatures? Alegos frowned. What dishonor? The New Republic risked much to recover a force sent here. There is much honor in that. Yes, perhaps there is. But it pales in comparison to the other things. Shadow Shai forced his hands open and spread them. As you said, this place has no military value. But they destroyed it. Why? And this mission of which you speak. They took dead bodies and used them as refuse to plant on a ship. Even you believe the body is a vessel, Commander Shai. This I have learned from you. Shadow Shai turned and stabbed a finger at Alegos. Yes, but a sacred vessel. One to be honored and cherished. We have ways, rituals, that show respect for all a fallen ancestor means. I have shared with you the results of such rituals. Here... The Yuzhan Vong leader found his hand and finger quivering as rage coursed through him. He thought for a second to hide it, but instead resisted that impulse. Here, bodies were burned where they lay. Limbs were not straightened. Comrades were not placed together. They were treated as if they were rubbish. And not only our bodies... This I could understand, after a fashion. But their own? The treatment of dead Yuzhan Vong bodies you can ascribe to ignorance. Alegos squatted near a carbonized skeleton. Of their own people, perhaps haste. We, too, honor our dead when possible. With your forces gathering, that clearly was not possible. It could be as you suggest. I have learned much from you. But now, I need to learn one more thing. Alegos glanced up, the sun flashing white from his golden fur. I do not think there is more I can tell you, Commander Shai. Oh, there is. The Yuzhan Vong pressed his two fists together. At the mention of a Jedi called Silverblade, you started, almost imperceptibly. When I mentioned Bimil, you again gave a sign of recognizing something. I shall assume you know this Jedi Silverblade. I have never denied knowing Jedi, but Silverblade you know very well. The Kamasi nodded and slowly stood. His name is Corin Horn. Corin Horn. Shadow Shai let the words roll around in his mouth. He linked the sound of them to the taste of the Jedi's blood from Bimiel. You didn't tell me he was the one who killed my kin at Bimiel. You never asked. If you are willing to be that coy, Alegos, you not only know him, 
but you care for him. You think to shield your friend from my wrath? The Kamasi lifted his chin, exposing his throat. Perhaps, Commander Shai, it is you I am shielding. You care for him, and fear for him. Shadow tapped an index finger against his battle mask's chin. Your loyalty is laudable, though to such a disreputable character, impossible to understand. You are wiser than that. Corin is not a stupid or dishonorable man, despite how you read what you see here. Alagos gathered his hands at the small of his back. None of the Jedi are stupid, nor are most of the leaders of the New Republic. You put too much weight on their ignorance of your ways, and you are swayed because of how little of them you understand. But, Alagos, you have taught me well. I understand much about them. The Kamasi ventured a small smile. And through my time with you I have some understanding of your ways— I am even led to believe that some sort of accord could be reached. This war does not have to go on forever. No, I would not want that. Shadow Shai folded his arms across his chest. If I were to open a dialogue, I would need an envoy I could trust implicitly. I have none such among my people. Olegos's eyes half shut. I could be your ambassador. Indeed, an excellent idea. Shadow Shai nodded slowly, then turned and beckoned Alagos to follow him. Come along. I will prepare you to deliver a message to these Jedi. A message they cannot possibly fail to understand. Chapter 23 Though there had been peace with the Imperial Remnant for over six years, Corin still felt a sense of dissonance as he watched Admiral Gilad Pelion enter the briefing room aboard the Ral Roost. Admiral Crefe greeted him warmly, shaking his hand. The Imperial Admiral acknowledged Master Skywalker with a nod, then turned and smiled at Corin. I had a chance to study your initial report from Garki. Good work. Corin blinked, then nodded. Jason Solo prepared the report. I just corrected some spelling. I'll pass your comments on to him. Please do. Pelion took a seat across from Corin at the lozenge-shaped briefing table. That left Admiral Crefe at the head, Master Skywalker at the Bothan's right hand, and Corin on Luke's right. We have quite a situation here. Crefe seated himself. We do on several different levels. I cannot thank you enough for having intervened when you did. The intelligence assets you have in the New Republic are clearly very thorough. Not as thorough as you might imagine. The Imperial officer leaned forward on his elbows pressing his hands flat against the table's black top. We can speak plainly, and we'll need to, before the politicians arrive. I brought my force here, after I heard of your abortive raid. My assumption was that either you had inserted assets onto the planet, or that a previous attempt to exfiltrate assets had been rebuffed. It suggested something of value on Garki, that I wanted to know about. So we had been there for two days, by the time you arrived. The data we recovered would have been yours immediately, regardless of what my superiors might have said. Crefe scratched with claws at his throat. And yes, we must speak plainly, because the politicians are going to complicate things incredibly. Corin sighed and slumped down in his seat a bit. The task force had leapt to the edge of the Garki system, rendezvoused with the Imperial force, then had plotted a course directly for Ithor. Admiral Crefe issued a call for reinforcements, scientific teams, and a lot of support that raised alarm on Coruscant. While they did say they were sending what they could, 
A report also came in that Borsk Thalia and a number of the key senators and ministers would be coming to Withor as well. Once there, no one had any doubts they would begin to interfere with what really needed to be a military operation. I harbor no illusions, Admiral Crefe. The Moths will be as opposed to my helping you defend Ithor as your leaders will be to having Imperial forces operating in the New Republic. Pelion's eyes narrowed. They are not going to see this the way we do. The battle for Ithor will determine the course of the war against the Yuzhan Vong. If we win here, they are blunted and can be driven back. If we lose here, I am not sanguine about the New Republic's chances for survival, nor those of Imperial space. We are in dire circumstances, to be certain. The Bothan's eyes tightened. You should know, Admiral, that we have no access to any of the Empire's old superweapons. Reports of their destruction are true, no matter what rumors to the contrary still circulate. Pelion smiled. And we have none either. It is just as well, because those weapons were difficult to employ in defense. And the remnant bringing them into the New Republic for whatever reason just would not be tolerable. Crefe nodded. The defense of Ithor will be difficult enough without having super weapons entering the mix. It's true this isn't going to be easy. Luke brushed a hand over his mouth. We have a couple of problems here on Ithor. The first is scientific. It is possible to take grafts from Baffor trees of the line that produced the pollen on Garki. However, the trees take years of growth before they become mature enough to produce pollen. Even if we take samples away and plant groves all over the New Republic, it could take as much as a decade before the plants would be able to produce the pollen we need. Corin frowned. But Ithorians are well known for their skill at cloning and genetic manipulation of botanicals. My grandfather maintains an ongoing correspondence with them concerning the stuff he does. They should be able to synthesize the pollen we need. The Jedi Master winced. This leads us to the second and more difficult problem we face. Regardless of whether synthetic pollen would be as effective as the genuine thing, Ithorian society is based on a religion that worships the forest and world and life. If we were asking them to produce something as medicine, something that would further life, they would agree in a heartbeat. We're asking them to manipulate this stuff of life to create a weapon. They won't do that. Crefe arched a pale eyebrow. There is no way to appeal such a decision. Luke shifted his shoulders uneasily. I have spoken with Rilal Torin the high priest who replaced Moma Nadon as the Athorian leader. The fact that the Baffor trees on Garki contributed pollen to the fight means they would be willing to let us harvest pollen and create new groves. They take the action on Garki as the trees consent to opposing the Yuzhan Vong. He is, however, reluctant to modify or abandon other tenets of their faith. For example... The Athorians apparently allow no one to set foot on Ithor. Pelion shook his head. I doubt the Yuzhan Vong will abide by that rule. Rilal knows that, and is willing to be somewhat practical in that matter. But it will require concessions on our part. Our people on the ground will have to be blessed. We'll have to observe certain restrictions. The Bothan Admiral sat back in his chair. The High Priest must realize that any restrictions are likely to be forgotten in the heat of battle. Luke nodded. He would not say that, but that is the sense I got from him. He is in a precarious position. The Athorians are very peaceful. This invasion, and even the preparation for it, could shatter Athorian society. Corin leaned forward. We are all agreed, though that the destruction of the Peskda Zena Botanical Garden on Garki is only buying us time. The Vong will attack Ithor. Given the threat it presents, I could see them just popping into the system and using Dovin basils to pepper the planet with asteroids. 
one solid impact, and pretty much everything dies. We can screen the planet against that, though. Pelion nodded. Asteroids would take long enough to come in that we could pulverize them. I would also have to think, Corin, that given how the Yuzhan Vong view biological things the same way we do machines, they would want to learn more about Ithor. Luke closed his eyes for a second, then opened them again. The report of what you saw on Garki could be a blueprint for what they could do with Ithor. No argument there. And we've not had another Cernpedal in this second wave. So the Vong leadership seems to be approaching things in a more logical manner. The Corellian Jedi shrugged. Standard defense, then? Engage in space to make landing troops difficult? Then fight them as they come down and on the planet? Kreefe nodded. I would prefer to stop them in space, but to neglect a planetary defense would be silly. We have some elite troops, both from the New Republic and Imperial space, that can take up positions on the ground. They're disciplined enough to work within the Athorian strictures, at least until hot light starts flying. The New Republic Admiral looked to his remnant counterpart. That decision, though, will be up to you, Admiral. Pelion looked startled. What are you saying? Kreefe smiled carefully. You are the senior officer here, with far more experience than I have. I've fought the Yuzhan Vong several times, and never come away with a clean victory. So I am not seeing something. I would like you to be in command of the defense of Ithor. Corin arched an eyebrow. Well, the politicians won't like that at all. The Bothan flashed fangs for a second. We can package the defense nicely, all this joint planning and everything, but when the battle comes, I still want you in charge, Admiral. By that point it will be too late for them to object. The human Admiral nodded slowly. You will be second in the chain of command, of course. Honored, yes. Pelion smiled quickly. And then who? Master Skywalker? The Bothan glanced at Luke. Jedi fought on the ground at Dantooine and again at Bimiel. Will they have a role here? Luke pressed his hands together, and Corin caught a faint impression of emotional pain from his master. Jedi were not combat troops, but were trained to fight in ways that would be very useful on Ithor. Because Ithor teemed with life, it fairly well pulsed with the Force, so Jedi would be drawn to defend it as well. Still, things they might be called upon to do would be outside the boundaries of strictly defensive action. The Jedi Master glanced at Corin. Your thoughts? No question we have to help with the defense. Corin sighed. In essence, the whole of the planet will be held hostage. I'm not sure there is anything we could do here short of slaughtering innocents that would be of the dark side. And I'm fairly certain there will be no Vong innocents on the planet. If there are Yuzhan Vong who surrender? Pelion asked. Luke shook his head. The slaves they use as proxy troops can't surrender. And the Yuzhan Vong themselves? Well, I have a hard time believing they would surrender to us. I don't know as how I'd trust any of them who would surrender. The Corellian frowned. On Dantooine, didn't Mara run into some who had killed civilians, then used Uglyph maskers to take on their appearance for the purpose of slaughtering more civilians? The Bothan tapped a talon on the table. Good point. We will have to review normal rules of engagement and inform our people that surrenders may not be respected. Not knowing about the Yuzhan Vong, about their culture and traditions, makes the task of figuring out how to fight them so much more difficult. We can guess, we can make inferences, but we just don't know. Pelion smiled. Grand Admiral Thrawn set great store by studying the art of a culture as a key to understanding it. I don't know what he would make of the Yuzhan Vong, but the few chists that came in from the unknown regions 
took to fighting them very eagerly. Yes, the chiss in their clawcraft. Crefe smoothed fur at the back of his neck. You can rest assured that Coruscant did not like hearing that there was a whole contingent of Thrawn's people lurking out there. I'm sure many of them fear you'll use the Chiss to carve a new empire from the New Republic. The human admiral shrugged. I might have, had I known they were there. But I was not privy to all of Thrawn's plans. When we issued a recall to all Imperial agents and troops, no matter where they were, this contingent showed up with Baron Fell's compliments, and led by his son. Corin shook his head. Who would have guessed? I knew. Luke's declaration came in a low voice, so low that Corin wasn't certain he'd heard it. Back during the Bothan crisis, when I went to find Mara, we found Admiral Park and Baron Fell. They were overseeing an effort set up by Thrawn, including a facility to clone a replacement of Thrawn. They indicated there was fighting going on in the Unknown Regions, that they were holding back some sort of threat to the Empire out there. They were no threat to us, so passing on the information about their existence out there would have been a distraction for the peace process. Crefe blinked his gold-flecked violet eyes. If certain ministers knew you'd withheld this sort of information, they would take it as proof positive that you desire some sort of Jedi hegemony to rise up, and you thought you could use the Chiss to make that happen. Corin frowned. That's nonsense. Oh, I know. I'm just telling you what will happen if that information gets out. For our purposes, though, we know we have someone holding that flank for us. This is good. The Bothan glanced at Pelion. How much in the way of military forces will you be able to bring here? My staff is still working up plans. At least one operational group. Four Imperial Star Destroyers, eight Victory-class Star Destroyers, and assorted support vessels. We can have them all here, or stage some at Yaga Minor to make a drive at Garki, since we have to assume they will be staging from there. Crefe nodded. I can draw comparable strength, though a number of the ships will have to be staged at Agamar. They will threaten Garki and also reinforce the escape route for anyone fleeing the Yuzhan Vong. If we have to, I can pull those resources from Agamar, but then we know that world will fall. Corin's heart sank at the Bothan's words. As much as he would have liked it to be otherwise... The chances were that Agamar would face a Yuzhan Vong assault and would be conquered. Its conquest might precede that of Ithor, allowing the Yuzhan Vong to secure an even closer staging area. But even slight pressure on Agamar could pin down New Republic forces, denying them to the defense of Ithor. The Yuzhan Vong had to attack Ithor and do it quickly, lest the New Republic be able to reinforce it enough that it couldn't be taken. The real problem with the loss of Agamar was that it would, in effect, cut the remnant off from the New Republic by shutting down a key hyperspace route between them. Aside from Ithor, the nearest New Republic world would be Ord Mantell. But getting from Yaga Minor to Ord Mantell was not easy, and involved a lot of minor jumps and a long time. Corin wasn't certain in the long run how much help the Remnant would be in the fight against the Yuzhan Vong. But since they'd just helped save his life, he was inclined to want them in the fight for the long run. Pelion shrugged stiffly. This is ever the plight of the military man. We know where we can deploy our forces for best effect. That is a rational decision based on numbers and analysis. We both know that Ithor is the key here. The Yuzhan Vong have to come in sufficient force to take it. If we strip defenses from elsewhere, we provide a tempting alternative target. Some people suffer, so others will not. We can provide the best response as per our brain, but it isn't the right response according to our hearts. He spread his arms wide. 
We have approximately two weeks before your leaders get here, and I imagine some of mine will arrive too. In that time, we will have to come up with a plan in which we show them we are splitting responsibility and risk to the gain of all. This means we will make concessions to political considerations that we don't want to make, in essence slipping binders on our own wrists before we go into this fight. I don't like that any more than you do. But the alternative is for our leaders, fighting between and among themselves, to impose their own binders on us. I'd much prefer the binders I choose than theirs. The man's eyes sparkled. After all, if I tie myself up, it's with the knowledge I can get out of the binders. And in this coming fight, if we can't do that, everything, Ithor, New Republic, and Imperial Space, is doomed. Chapter 24 for Jaina Solo, the absurdities of the reception would not end. To begin with, the reception was a formal affair that took place on the Tefanda Bay, one of the Athorian herdships, cities that drifted lazily above the jungle. The transparasteel-domed ships, with their own ecosystems and loaded with plant life, were kept warm and very humid. In everyday clothes, she didn't mind it, but dressed up in formal Jedi robes, she found the atmosphere heavy and oppressive. Just having such a formal affair on a planet that was going to be the focal point for an enemy assault struck her as wrong. She would have preferred to be up on the Ral Roost with the rest of Rogue Squadron. It annoyed her, too, that she had been invited because of her status as a Solo and a Jedi, not as a member of Rogue Squadron. Colonel Darklighter had been chosen to represent the Squadron and Jaina got a distinct impression that the New Republic's protocol experts were afraid the pilots might actually speak their minds and disrupt things. The tension of those gathered in the room seemed almost as oppressive as the humidity. They had been gathered into a large hall that was open, though overarching tree branches made glimpses of the night sky through the dome few and far between. More impressive than the trees, though, was the way the wood covering the floor and paneling the walls had been fitted together. A rich gold in color, with dark streaks of grain, the strips formed a mosaic through which the lines flowed effortlessly. Jaina could have followed the grain with her eyes forever, but knots of diplomats kept eclipsing it. From years of watching her mother attend, and attend to such functions, she knew diplomatic contacts operated in an unreal world. Mortal enemies would be unfailingly polite face-to-face -face while plotting ruthlessly behind closed doors. Even Admiral Quife and Colonel Darklighter would withhold criticism of political limits placed on their operations so the impression could be created that all was well. She sighed. At least that means people will be polite to the Jedi. Such a sigh. Did it relieve the weariness in your spirit? Jaina turned and smiled, recognizing the voice. Yes, Scanner, a bit. She kept the smile in place, despite the little shock she felt at seeing the livid scar on his face. The older Jedi sipped a cup of wine, then gave her a little nod. I suppose perhaps I should try a sigh. Why? Oh, she glanced past Ganner in his robes of blue and black toward a knot of Jedi paying court to Kip Duran. I had heard there was some trouble. Ganner gave her a wry grin that made him a different sort of handsome in her eyes. My experiences on Bimiel, and especially Garki, were sobering, since many Jedi have been called here to help oppose the Yuzhan Vong and are eager to do so. My sharing rather frank views about how dangerous the Yuzhan Vong are is not welcome. Realism becomes synonymous with defeatism in their eyes. Probably didn't help that you saved Corin's life on Vimeo. Ganner snorted a quick laugh. No, it didn't. I don't regret it, however. The lessons I've learned working with him are lessons I needed to learn. 
I'm glad I lived long enough to do it. She glanced down for a moment. I'm sorry you got hurt. I'm not. His blue eyes narrowed. Before I got this scratch, it was easy to believe in my own invincibility. I was arrogant enough to think of myself as perfect. That's a trap Kip, Worth, Okta, and others in his cabal are falling into. They think that because they've not been hurt, they can't be hurt. That's not an illusion I harbor anymore. I don't think I have many illusions anymore, either. Jaina shifted her shoulders to relieve some of the stiffness in them. We have been simming a lot to prepare us for the Vong assault. I must end up dead half the time I fly. Ganner winced. Not good. Well, not as bad as it might sound. Part of the time we sim flying skips, to help train the others. The imps we are able to smoke, but the chiss are just deadly. I've felt their presence, but haven't seen any of them. Neither have I, except on my aft scope, drilling my X-wing or skip. She glanced toward the front of the grand courtyard in which people had been gathered. Up there had been raised a dais with Rilal Tauran and his attendants greeting the various New Republic functionaries. Looks like home team introductions have started. The Remnants people will be next, and then maybe the Chiss. It will be interesting to get a look at them. Ganner waved his hand in the direction of the dais. After you. Thanks. Jaina almost hesitated, both because of Ganner's courtesy which she had not expected, and because of her desire to see the Chiss herself. It's their leader I want to see. She started to blush for a moment, but chased that sensation away with a burst of irritation. In all of the simulations, she had flown well. Perhaps she hadn't always been the best pilot in the squadron, but she'd been close to it. Every time she'd simmed against the Chiss and been shot out, their leader had been the one to kill her. She never had the sense that he was picking on her specifically. But to double-check that, she pulled the statistical data from the simulator battles. Over and over again, the Chiss leader had gone after the hottest of the enemy pilots, picking them off in descending order. None of them made it easy for him, and both Wedge and Tico had managed to kill him once. But in every statistical category the simulators measured, he was skewing the bell curve to the high side. And that would not have been so bad, she decided, if he and the Chiss didn't keep to themselves. She didn't mind being shot out, but she hated the idea of being dismissed for dying. She and Ganner slipped toward the front of the crowd as Luke and Mara Skywalker were welcomed. Polite but muted applause arose from the assembled dignitaries, with most of it coming from the Athorians. They clearly welcomed a Jedi presence on their world, though Jaina sensed that Borsk Felia would be perfectly happy if those Jedi died in the defense of Ithor. Next came the Imperial Remnants contingent. Admiral Pelion came first and moved down the long line of dignitaries with an economy of motion that suggested he wanted nothing but to be back planning Ithor's defense. A wave of emotional warmth rolled off him as he greeted Admiral Crefe, Colonel Darklighter, Luke Skywalker, and Wedge Antilles. It lessened slightly as he shook hands with Jaina's mother, then took his place beside her as the other Imperials were introduced. Several Moffs had made the trip to Ithor, and all of them looked like tired functionaries, save for Ethan Soretti, the Moth from Bastion. What impressed Jaina about him was the genuine sense of enthusiasm pouring off him as he greeted Borsk Felia and the New Republic's other ministers. He exchanged comments with each of them, apparently impressing them with his knowledge of their lives or homes. Shock exploded from most of them, with tendrils of suspicion snaking out in its wake. Ganner half smiled. Well now. There's a plaything to keep Chief of State Failure occupied. Good. Give him less time to advise the military about the defense of Ithor. Any comment Ganner might have been about to offer died as a new and strong presence sent ripples out through the Force. 
Jaina knew from having been around people like her father and Wedge Antilles that these ripples didn't come from any conscious use of the Force. Some people just so brimmed with life and confidence that they shone like a magnesium flare in darkest night. She rose up on tiptoes to see who it was, then felt a shock run through her. At the head of a dozen blue-skinned chiss came a human walking along with a crisp formality to his step. Taller than she was, but not as tall as Ganner, he had a wiry muscularity about him that his black uniform could not hide. His black hair had been cut short, which showed off a white lock that traced the line of a scar that started at his right eyebrow and ran back into his hair. His pale green eyes seemed tinged with a chill that matched his manner. Only the red stripes along his pants legs and cuffing his sleeves seemed at odds with his solemnity. He mounted the dais at a step, leaving the Chiss in their white uniforms to file along the front of the platform and stand at attention. He bowed sharply to Rilal Torin and shook his hand. The Athorian high priest turned to introduce him to Borsk Felia, but the Chiss leader bypassed the chief of state and the rest of his cabinet. He marched along until he met Admiral Crefe, again executed a stiffly formal bow, and shook hands. He repeated this process with Colonel Darklighter and Luke Skywalker. As he moved down the line, gasps and hubbub began to rise in the crowd. It increased as he bowed before Wedge, then smiled and allowed the older man to enfold him in a hug. Before Jaina could figure out what was happening there, the Chiss leader greeted Admiral Pelion. Ignoring the remnant moths, the young man then stepped off the front of the dais. He's coming straight at me. He drew himself up before her, straight of limb and muscularly taut, then snapped his head and upper body forward in a bow that was not as deep as that given the others, but was nonetheless respectful. I am Jagged Fell. He straightened, and she started to blush as his green-eyed gaze raked her over. A Jedi, too. Fascinating. Jaina blinked. Two? In addition to being a superior pilot, you are a difficult kill. She wasn't sure why, but she smiled at him. You meant that as a compliment. Jag Fell nodded. Among the Chiss, it is high praise indeed. I was only a bit better than you at your age. Which was what, about two years ago? Ganner asked mockingly. Neither Fell's expression nor his sense in the Force betrayed any embarrassment at Ganner's question. Yes, just before I took command of my squadron. Wedge Antilles stepped down from the dais and approached them. Colonel Fell. Yes, uncle? You should return to the dais and greet those people you bypassed. Wedge nodded toward Borsk Felia and his confederates. They're fairly important. Fell shook his head. They're politicians. Wedge lowered his voice. The impression is that you skipped them because they are not human. Fell turned to face the dais and raised his voice. If they believe I did not greet them because they are not human, they are stupid. I did not greet them because they are politicians. A Sulliston senator stepped forward. A convenient label behind which you hide your xenophobia. Surprise stiffened Fell's spine, and disbelief flooded his words. You are accusing me of having an anti-alien bias? Po, a Quarren senator, opened his hands. It floods from you, Colonel Fell. Your uniform is cut on imperial lines, hearkening back to the uniform of your father's 181st Imperial Fighter Group, one of the most effective imperial units at suppressing the rebellion. Your formality. Greetings like that were last seen at the imperial court. The disdain with which you bypassed us makes it more than obvious. Fell shook his head. Where I come from... Borsk failure cut him off. Where you come from is an archaeo-imperial community, 
Grand Admiral Thrawn gathered his most staunch and reactionary followers and set them up like a pocket of infection. You've festered out there, hating every moment we have been in control of what was once your empire. You've inherited the attitudes that oppressed us for ages, and now here you are ready to resume control, all under the guise of helping us. Stop, please. The Chiss leader held up a hand. Don't make even more of a fool of yourself. Borsk Felia's violet eyes blazed. How patronizing! You have to tell me what is best for me? You, born to privilege, have no idea what it is like to be discriminated against because of your species. You have no idea what it is like to sacrifice to win freedom. He flicked a hand at the dozen chess before the dais. You even dare parade your non-human subordinates before us, reminding us of how Imperials should always be in the lead. Jaina felt a cold calm come over Jag Fell, as his hands slowly unknotted. Where I come from, Chief Felia, I am in the minority. I am the alien. If you remember anything from the history of your precious rebellion, it is that Thrawn was uncompromising, and that is a trait of his people. I was raised among them, raised with them, judged by their standards. I met those standards. I exceeded those standards. He took a step forward and pointed at the Chiss men and women who had accompanied him. I won command of my squadron. These people competed to join that squadron. They wanted to fly with me, not because I am a man or because I am an imperial, but because I am a superior pilot and leader. And as for fighting for my freedom, I've been doing that in the unknown regions for all my life. My mother gave birth to five children. My older brother died fighting, as did a younger sister. Why are we out there? Why are we fighting? A threat to the New Republic like the Yuzhan Vong has long been anticipated. You remember the devastation of the Yavithan Great Purge? There were things in the unknown regions that would have made it look insignificant, save we were there and stopped them. Fell pressed his hands together. You accuse me of xenophobia, but you ignored the fact that I greeted my host, an Athorian, and immediately greeted Admiral Crefe, a Bothan. You saw what you wanted to see. This is what you accuse me of, accuse Imperials of, that we saw only bestiality where there was sapience and nobility. I have come here to help defend you against the Yuzhan Vong, and yet what you choose to see is some specter of the past. He looked around the room. That is why I bypassed you. I came to fight a war, not to play political games. My mission is to help you maintain your freedom, not to help you gather more power to yourself or to take it from you. Leia Organa Solo stepped forward, holding a hand out to forestall any rebuttal by the New Republic's Bothan leader. We want that help. From you, from the Remnant, from all the peoples of the New Republic. Working together is the only way we will defeat the Yuzhan Vong and save Ithor. People began applauding her mother's words, and Jaina joined them. With public agreement, the politicians retreated a bit, and it would have been easy to imagine the situation had been solved. Still, Jaina found herself haunted by what Felia and the others had said. The vehemence in their words had previously been directed at her mother, with similar accusations of her desire to take power away from non-humans. And whispers about the Jedi blaming them for the loss of Garki and Dubrillion, somehow suggesting the Jedi brought the Yuzhan Vong down on the New Republic. They make me wonder if we're not being positioned to take the blame if Ithor falls. Jag Fell turned and looked at her, and Jaina wondered if somehow he were reading her mind. She met his stare unflinchingly. We will save Ithor. He nodded. We will win the battle for Ithor. Its salvation, well... 
he spared a glance for the knot of New Republic politicians. Its salvation is in other hands, and, I am afraid, is beyond our ability to control. Chapter 25 Jason Solo clasped his hands at the small of his back. He'd answered his uncle's call for the Jedi to assemble in a small grove on an upper level of the Tafanda Bay. Though he could still feel Jaina's presence in the floating Athorian city, he was a bit surprised that she had not come to the meeting. Given the impression he was getting from her, he knew she was simming again, and he momentarily resented how the squadron was keeping her separate from him and the Jedi. Standing there between Ganner and Anakin, Jason caught himself thinking negatively about his sister, and probed his own feelings. He felt a tinge of jealousy, because she clearly loved flying with Rogue Squadron, and Jason was very proud of how well she had succeeded in her role as a fighter pilot. He knew she'd not abandon her Jedi heritage or training, but was just finding another way to employ it. Following in Corin Horn's tradition of serving the squadron, Jason glanced down the line and saw Corin. Jason had accepted the task of trying to be the sort of Jedi that Corin and Luke had become. He acknowledged doing good and necessary work on Belkaden and Garki, but still he had a sense of dissatisfaction haunting him. Memories of the slaughter on Dantooine reminded him what the worst of that Jedi tradition could be. He knew that none of them had been given any choice by the Yuzhan Vong. They had to kill soldiers, or many more people would have been killed. They had been acting as defenders there, so there had been no hint of the dark side attached to their actions. And yet many creatures died. Jason found himself once again returned to a philosophical question that he could not see a way around. If the Force was something that bound all life together, could killing be in any way justified? The Jedi Code says there is no death, only the Force. But the death of billions on Alderaan and Corrida was enough to send shockwaves through the Force. If that was true, then didn't lesser deaths also have an effect? As certain as he was that he didn't have an answer for that basic paradox, he knew there was one out there. Anakin had suggested that in his search he was circling the answer, and he couldn't fault his little brother's insight. But in circling something, I know at the very least there is something to circle. Now I just have to find what it is I'm circling. Two things served to rock Jason out of his internal journey. The first was the arrival of Rilal Torin, the Athorian High Priest, along with Luke. Until the Athorian showed up, Jason had no idea why they had been called together, and the solemnity with which the High Priest and the Jedi Master moved suggested that the reason for the meeting was most serious. The entry of Desharakor into the room, slipping through the hatchway after Luke and taking up a position beside Octoramus, likewise underscored the seriousness of the situation. Ever since Luke had arrived at Ithor, the Twi'lek Jedi had been kept secluded at her request. He knew Luke had spent time with her, but he had offered no explanation for her search for superweapons. Luke Skywalker stood before the two dozen Jedi and inclined his head toward them. Brothers and sisters, Rilal Tauren is here to prepare us for what will be our part in the coming struggle. Listen well to what he has to say. Though we are here to save Ithor, we could, through negligence, destroy it. That cannot happen. The Ithorian nodded acknowledgment of Luke's words, then looked over the Jedi in silence for a moment. He interlaced his fingers and let his hands rest against his belly, then slowly began speaking in a voice that was as resonant as it was low. We welcome you, the Jedi, here, and thank you for what you will do for us. I speak not just as myself, but for the Mother Jungle, above which we drift, and for the Athorian people. We are one, and wish for your communion with us. 
he again studied the assembled Jedi. When his gaze fell upon Jason, the young Jedi found a blush rising to his face. He knew of no reason he should feel ashamed, then realized that what embarrassed him was the sense of complete calm coming from the Athorian. Jason's own wondering about his future ran smack up against a confidence in Torin's life and life choices. He feels about himself as I wish to feel about myself. Rilal Torin opened his hands and spread his arms. You all have heard that no one is allowed to set foot on Ithor. This statement is materially correct in its translation into basic, but not absolutely true. We have pilgrims who do go down into our world, tending the forests, visiting sacred places from before technology allowed us to build floating cities, and to survey damage done after storms or fires. Before they make such journeys, they prepare themselves spiritually. You will journey to the surface if needs be. We wish then to prepare you, so you will accept the world as your mother, and the world will accept you as its children. The high priest's eyes blinked slowly. In order to do this, you need to become other than yourself. No one is allowed on the surface. Those who are allowed are not themselves. Jason frowned for a second, but caught a glimpse of Corin nodding to himself, so he assumed the mystery was not impenetrable. He recalled some of his early training, in which he was required to open himself to the Force, to let go of himself so the Force could fill him. To become one with the Force, I had to become more than I had been before. But that meant casting off the image of who I thought I was. Each pilgrim, in making the journey to the Mother Jungle, wishes to become closer to the jungle. To facilitate change and growth, the pilgrim looks at pruning aspects of herself that keep her from being one with the world below. So it shall be with you. You must think upon that part of yourself that closes you in, and that is the part of yourself you need to modify. You will share those things. Out loud? Worth Skidder, over next to Kip Duran, shook his head. This is a waste of time. We should be getting ready to fight the Vong. Luke frowned. This is more important than that, Worth. The Athorian High Priest pressed his hands together. If you feel we are wasting your time, you may be excused. What? Worth folded his arms across his chest. We're here to save your world. You need to save yourself first, Jedi. The Athorian spoke quietly from both sides of his mouth. Until you wish to be saved, the Mother Jungle can do you no good. I don't under... Kip laid his left hand against Worth's folded arms. The confusion is ours. We understand, Rilal Torin, and will respect your customs. The Athorian nodded assent, then spread his hands again. The public declaration is meant to enlist everyone in aiding the pilgrim in making the transition toward unity with the jungle. In sharing the burden, we, as diverse a community as the plants and creatures that make up the mother jungle, function together in a complex ecosystem. It is only through functioning together that we can succeed. Luke Skywalker turned toward the Athorian. If it would be permitted, I would like to go first. We would be honored, Master Skywalker. I renounce responsibility. Luke's eyes narrowed, and Jason could feel shock rise from some of the other Jedi. 
For a long time, I've felt weighed down by being sole heir to a Jedi tradition. I've cheated you. You're all my co-heirs. I know you'll accept shares of the responsibility I've carried around with me. I have every confidence in you. A chill ran down Jason's spine. He'd never had any doubt that his uncle trusted him. But their relationship was more than student and master. A lot of the trust bled over from the family ties. For the first time, he caught a sense of what it might have been like to be Ganner or Corin or Desharakor. Luke's renunciation was a gift to them all, one that bound them together and tied them to the jungle. The other Jedi began to make their own declarations. They came in no particular order, but were voiced as each person felt his time had come. Jason listened to them, less trying to understand their words than marveling in the sense of peace their declarations seemed to kindle in them. He desperately sought that aspect of himself that locked him away from such peace, so he could feel inside how they felt. Anakin surprised him by stepping forward fairly quickly. His little brother's shoulders straightened, and his voice did not waver. I give up self-assuredness. I want so much to be right, to do the right thing, that I don't look to see if another answer would be a better answer. Judging yourself right is a destination. I'm just on a journey. At the far end of the line, Desharakor looped one leku back over her shoulder. I renounce hatred. The description of the Yuzhang Vong taking slaves made me hate them as I hated those who had enslaved my mother. That hatred made me do stupid things. No more. I will stop the Yuzhang Vong, because they must be stopped, but I will not hate them. I'll ditch fear. Corin ran his left hand over his mouth. All my life I've been afraid of failing. My father, my wife, my children, my friends, all of you. But no more. Failure is not part of the menu here. So fearing it, fearing anything else, is pointless. Ganner nodded once, sharply. I can do without pride. It's blinded me to many things, not the least of which is how deadly the Yuzhan Vong can be. The jungle doesn't need a blind guardian. Octoramus slipped past Desharakor. Mourning a friend the Vong took from me has blinded me. I'll lay him to rest. Fear. Pride. Hatred. Even his brother's retreat from assuming he knew more than he did. All of these things struck Jason as laudable. Yet none of them is right for me. At least not right now. He sighed, feeling a thousand questions bubbling up through his mind. Which one is right for me? His jaw dropped open as his flesh puckered. As his surprise at the answer shook him, he almost laughed, though to do so would destroy the dignity of the ceremony. The simplicity of the answer astounded him, and yet the peace that settled over him as a result of discovering it almost made him giddy. He stepped past Ganner and Anakin. I renounce the need to know now what I will become later. In looking to my future... I have ignored the present and my role in it. The present is too critical for me to do that any more. Even before his uncle nodded to him, a warmth had begun to spread from his heart throughout his body. He'd not abandoned his search for his place as a Jedi, just drained the urgency from it. That energy he redirected into his efforts to defend Ithor. The sense of well-being he had as a result left him no question that he'd made the right choice. I just have to hope I live long enough to continue on my path, be it a circle or toward a goal. The Jedi all went through their declarations. Worth renounced weakness with a vehemence meant to hide his insecurities. 
Kip rejected pride, using words meant to suggest that the glory of one was the glory of all. He clearly was trying to bring all the Jedi together as Luke had done, but from Jason's new perspective, the effort just seemed transparent. Somehow, Jason knew that the high priest must have seen past the blinds worth Kip and a few others raised, but the Athorian gave no sign of it. You Jedi, through your link with the Force, understand how life is woven together with life. You know how one thing touches another. Here today, you are woven together with the Mother Jungle and the Athorian people. Our fates are ever intertwined. We welcome your strength and sincerity. We offer you our support and love. As fibers woven are stronger than those alone, so shall we all be strong together, facing this threat. The Athorian lowered his hands, then shook hands with the Jedi Master. Luke remained at the front of the room as we Lal Tauren made for the egress hatchway. The Athorian paused only once, to rest his hands on Desharakor's shoulders and whisper in her ear. Then he exited the room. Luke waited for the hatch to close behind the high priest, then stood there, shrouded in his cloak. So you all know, our exact role in the fight has not been decided. From the computer system here, you can pull an abstract of the various plans that have been floated for us. You can pretty much ignore any that were not initiated by Admirals Pelion or Crefe, or by me. I will have assignments for us all. Kip frowned. You cede us responsibility, but we have no part in deciding how we will be used. The Jedi Master smiled easily. To you, I ceded responsibility for your own actions. To the military, I have ceded responsibility for what we will do. How we accomplish their goals, this we will all have input on. They will decide what must be done, and we will decide how Jedi can best accomplish those tasks. He looked around the room. That's all for now. May the Force be with you. The Jedi broke down into little groups and slowly started to filter from the enclosed grove. Luke walked directly over toward Jason and Anakin and opened his arms. He rested a hand on each of his nephew's shoulders. I'm very proud of the two of you. The things you said, well, as the High Priest has said, the jungle is no place for children. What you said shows you're not children. Jason rested his right hand on his uncle's mechanical one. Thank you, Master. Me too, Uncle Luke. Thanks. Anakin smiled broadly at first, then composed his face much more solemnly. I'm ready to do whatever you need me to do, no matter what. Ganner chuckled quietly. Given your experience fighting the Yuzhan Vong, perhaps you should be given command of our contingent. Luke arched an eyebrow. I'm not sure that much responsibility should be placed on his shoulders just yet. But some day. Desharakor cut through the crowd of other Jedi and paused a couple of meters shy of the group. Mister, if I could have a moment. Luke turned toward her. Please, join us. Yes, Master. The woman approached, then looked down at her hands. Her leku twitched ever so slightly, betraying her nervousness. I just wanted to thank you for trusting me inviting me here, allowing me to participate in this ceremony. I have been doing a lot of thinking, self-examination. Until asked to articulate things here, I had not understood exactly why I had done what I did, or what that was doing to me. I had allowed my hatred to make as much of a slave of me as my mother had been. I don't regret opposing slavery, or opposing the Yuzhan Vong, 
but I can't do it for the wrong reasons. Winning or preserving freedom is good. Seeking retribution is not. The Jedi Master nodded. That's a lesson we all need to keep in mind. I'm glad to have you back with us, Desharakor. The struggle we'll face will demand the best. And here I think we have the best. Corin, who had joined the group, sighed heavily. We'll just have to hope that our best is enough. I can't shake the feeling the battle for Ithor will be the last for some of us. If we can't stop them here, well, perhaps becoming one with the Mother Jungle won't be the worst thing that could happen. Chapter 26 Freed from the embrace of pain, Shadao Shai reached out and grasped one of the device's slender limbs in his left hand. He hung on as tightly as he was able, then lunged his body quickly to the right. His left shoulder popped loudly, the sound echoing within his cabin aboard the Legacy of Torment. The arm slipping back into the socket sparked an urgent explosion of pain and sent it rippling through him, weakening his knees. He might have dropped to the floor, save that surrendering to the pain would have tarnished it. And it would not do to let my subordinate see any weakness. He turned his head slowly to where Dane Leon stood, eyes averted to decking. You have a reason to disturb me? Commander, yes. Many reasons. Then give me the best one. The implied threat in his command shook Leon, and Shadow Shai took secret pleasure in that. His subordinate did not look up, and could not quite rid his voice of a minor tremor. My leader, we believe we have determined what it was that the Jedi sought to hide on Garki. Really? The Yuzhan Vong leader kept his voice light, his tone questioning. After so long, why is it you think you have succeeded now? As you will recall, Commander, we had great difficulty with the probes we were using in that area. We had a high failure rate on them. It was assumed that one generation of them had an undetected defect in the breeding. We employed another, and had similar results. Shadow Shai nodded. You have bored me with these excuses before. Lian's shoulders shifted slightly. The creatures we were using are a strain related to Von Doon crabs. We employed another device while doing forensic examinations of the searchers that had failed. The searchers had inflammations of their respiratory systems, and with the new scanning creatures, we discovered pollen grains. The searchers died of an allergic reaction to the pollen. Von Doon crab armor had a more immediate and violent reaction to the pollen. The Yuzhan Vong leader held up his left hand ignoring the grinding in his shoulder. The idea that their armor fell prey to a naturally occurring element in the environment stunned him. That revelation had serious implications. The first, on a purely military level, was that now the enemy had a weapon they could employ that would seriously handicap the Yuzhan Vong warriors. He had no doubt the enemy would use it. He would not have hesitated were he as beset as they were. Suddenly, every combat situation was a potential disaster. The second and more fundamental issue was that of biological and botanical opposition to their invasion. Ever since the invasion had been ordered, one of the motivating forces had been that the enemy were machinists. They created machines that mocked the living with their pseudo-life. Their reliance on machines marked them as defective, as weak, as contemptible, and certainly as deserving of death. They were infidels, blasphemers, and heretics, with no help of justification of their lives. But now, a living thing opposes us. He shook his head ever so slightly, 
realizing how dangerous was the battlefield that this development could lead him to. Just as a political faction had struck prematurely to gain control of the invasion, now the priesthood could use this new opposition to strengthen their influence. While Shadow Shai had every faith in the validity of the crusade in spite of this discovery, war was a task best left to those trained to it. His eyes narrowed. Who knows the information you have revealed to me? Just myself and those who investigated it. The hint of a smile snaked its way across Leon's lips. They have been isolated. No word of this will escape. Very good. He gave his subordinate a sincere nod. You have isolated the plant that produced this pollen? The Bathor trees, which are native to the planet they call Ithor. The world is within our current invasion corridor, accessible from Garki. Leon lifted his chin. I have taken the liberty of preparing a plan for the planet's annihilation. A repeat of Cernpedal's destruction? Leon shook his head. No, Commander. My researchers have assured me that they can prepare an assault weapon with which we can seed the planet. Ithor is rich in organic matter. Destroying it will be simple. Shadow Shai raked a talon over his own chin and down his throat, feeling it click along the folds in his leathery flesh. Stand off the world? Deliver the agent? Most efficient, my leader. Indeed, but wasteful. Shadow Shai shook his head. That is not how we will do it. Why not? Impatience flashed over Leon's face. He flicked a hand toward the planet below. Even the conquest of a planet like Garki was not without casualties, and that is accepting the deaths in the garden. The infidels must be fortifying Ithor. They cannot allow us to take it from them. Fighting there will be fierce. The Yuzhan Vong commander lunged at his aid and flicked a backhanded slap at the younger warrior's throat. Leon's hands came up, but not fast enough. The blow landed, not hard, but hard enough to drive him back a step and wring a choked gasp from him. Leon immediately dropped to his knees and touched his forehead to the deck. Forgive this one, leader, for angering you. His harsh croak carried little contrition to Shadow Shai's ears, but the fear shooting through it brought him satisfaction. Do you think we will be defeated in taking Ithor? No, master. Do you think our warriors will shrink from the possibility of dying there? No, master. Good. Shadow Shai spun away from Leon and let his heel spurs click on the decking as he began to pace. What you suggest would be most efficient, but would hurt us more than help. We need to show them that we will crush them, no matter their preparations. So far, we have not launched a solid military operation against any of their worlds. Yes, we took Garki, but the opposition was minimal. The subsequent infiltration and exfiltration of agents taints that victory. As you point out, they must fortify Ithor. When we take it... We will send a message out to the rest of the New Republic with the survivors. That message is that we are implacable and invincible. That is the message our enemies need to hear. With all due respect, Commander, this one thinks you have spent too much time with Alagos. Do you... Shadow Shai turned slowly, allowing a heel spur to tease a squeal from the decking as he did so. From him I learned much about our enemies. Now he will bear to them a message from me. 
His preparation for this role is complete, and now we know where we may deliver the message. Ithor, he will return to his people there, and will not fail me. That is all well and good, Commander, but your concern with how they think... It... It what? Shadow Shai walked over to Leon and pressed his right foot down on his subordinate's head. It has me flirting with heresy. Have I done anything that indicates I have abandoned our ways? Have I used a machine? Have I said I doubt what we are doing? Have I questioned the dictates of the gods or priests? No, my leader, but... But nothing, Leon. There is much Alagos could teach you, Leon. Even in the few days he will remain with us. The Yuzhan Vong commander increased the pressure, mashing Leon's forehead against the deck. You offer me a plan that will be effective from a tactical standpoint, but ineffective on a strategic level. Moreover, your plan could be considered blasphemy, since it would destroy a storehouse of life. Ithor could be a gift to us from the gods, requiring us to wrest it from the enemy. And you would destroy it, rather than do what the gods wish and liberate it. Shadow Shai pulled his toes back, cocking his ankle, allowing his heel spur to dig into Leon's scalp. Flexing his knee and lifting his thigh, he brought his subordinate's head up. Once he could see Leon's eyes, he pulled the spur free and stood there. He watched in silence until a thin ribbon of blood started dripping slowly on the deck. You are fortunate, Leon, for I will not let you disgrace yourself. You shall accomplish that which is the will of the gods. Shadow Shai folded his arms across his chest. You will plan for me an assault on Ithor to commence a month from now. You will likewise plan a feint in force at the world Agamar. It will fall, or we will take it after we take Ithor. You will plan these assaults using all the assets assigned to me. Commander, this is an honor, but should you not plan these assaults, I will review and modify your plans. You are competent enough to lay the basic groundwork. While you do that, I will continue a job that only I can do. He nodded slowly. Alagos will provide our first avenue of attack on the New Republic. Within a week, he will be doing our work for us. Then I will have time to oversee what you have drawn up, correct it, and make it work. Yes, my leader. Leon nodded slowly. It shall be done as you order it. One last thing. Commander, no word of this pollen goes out to anyone. If your people can find a way to modify armor to be immune, good. If not, we will fight without living armor. Shadow Shai smiled. We are the Yuzhan Vong. Our cause is right and just. The gods armor us when we go into combat. And entering it in a dead shell is just a sign of our faith in them. Dane Leon retreated to his cabin aboard the Legacy of Torment and closed and sealed the hatch behind him. The small, ovoid enclosure had almost enough room for him to walk through it without scraping his head against the ceiling. He kept his head ducked, not wanting to smear blood on the ceiling then dropped to his knees at the small storage space beneath his bed and pulled forth a sclipion. He gently set the creature on top of the bed so the line where the two halves of its shell met faced him. 
reaching around to the sensory tissue at the hinge, Leon ran his fingers over it in the combination of movements to which the creature had been trained to respond. The upper half of the domed shell rose, revealing a villip nestled there like a pearl. The Yuzhan Vong stroked the villip once to waken it, and felt his pulmonary arch quicken its pumping, as the communications creature morphed with the features of his true master. Leon ducked his head immediately. Master, forgive this intrusion, but this one must report. Proceed. The villip voiced the command flatly, but it still contained a hint of his master's tone. It was as you suggested it would be. I offered Shadow Shai the plan to destroy Ithor, but he rejected it. Instead, he would have us assault it in a most conventional manner. And, perhaps, in not so conventional a manner. The brows on the face assumed by the villip arrowed downward. Explain. Leon kept his face expressionless, and flattened his voice. He knew that in crafting his answer, he was playing a dangerous game. But Shadow Shai demanded he play it. He was likewise certain that his master knew he was playing, but might not know the depths of his skill at political manipulation. He remains obsessed with the infidel. He has not enough time to spend on planning the Ithorian assault. He is so preoccupied. He is convinced eliminating the threat that is Ithor would be detrimental to the future of our assault— because of how it would make the enemy feel about us. What matters how the infidels feel? The villip did manage to communicate his master's scorn. You will plan this assault for him, and plan it well. You will calculate the appropriate amount of force you will need to take the world, then advocate bringing a handful more ships. Shadow Shai will slash your estimates— he will be made to look a fool. As you will it, master. It shall be done. Dane Leon nodded enthusiastically, then made a quick play. Before long, all praise shall gather to your name, master. Soon, on the lips of many, will be— Quiet, fool! Leon dipped his head sharply. Beg pardon, master. Do not make me wonder about you. You are in position to see that the right things happen. I would hate to have to find another asset to replace you. But it is not impossible. Yes, master. Leon let a dollop of fear swirl through his words. As long as the war master thought as little of him as Shadow Shai did, Dane Leon could successfully play both of them against each other. Shadow Shai would have to lose this round— so Leon could be appointed as his replacement. But then his political patron would have to fall. Only then can I reach the ascendancy for which I was bred. Continue your work. Report as needed, and keep me apprised as the battle for Ithor unfolds. You are doing good work. The gods work. The face on the villip assumed a serene expression. When our conquest is complete, then you shall be rewarded greatly. Thank you, master. This one is ever your loyal and obedient servant. Leon reached up and closed the sclipune. He would have laughed, but a droplet of blood splashed on the creature's shell. Leon reached up and found his hair wet with blood, with the circular wound puckered and swollen. He probed it with his fingers for a second, then shrugged, pleased that it would result in yet one more scar. He hid the sclipune away, then licked at the blood on his fingers. All the indignities he suffered from Shadow Shai would be repaid in one grand surprise for his superior— the only pity is, he will not see my hand in his downfall. For an instant he regretted that, then shunted aside his regret. 
That satisfaction I can forego. It is a sacrifice I offer to the gods. He smiled broadly, confident they would find the sacrifice pleasing. By Shadow Shai's command, it would be a month until the battle for Ithor. A month more to endure humiliation. A month before I assume the office that long ago should have been mine. Chapter 27 Luke found Mara standing at the large viewport in the suite they'd been given on the Tafanda Bay. He caught a bit of surprise from her as she entered the cabin, but the spike leveled quickly as she recognized him. She'd been hugging her arms around herself as she looked out at the mother jungle below, and let them slacken slightly. But Luke laced his fingers through hers and hugged her from behind. He kissed her neck. How are you doing? Mara nodded confidently. Good. Very good. High Priest Tauren stopped by and graciously performed with me the ritual he did for the Jedi and others. I felt ashamed that I'd not been there with the Jedi, but... It's okay, Mara. We would have loved to have you there, but we want you rested to be at your best. She leaned her head to the right, gently touching her temple to his. I know, and that's very sweet of you, Luke, but there are times I feel like a malingerer. In some ways, Ithor seems so peaceful that maintaining an edge is tough for me. It's not so much that I like strife, it's just that I've been trained to deal with it. I'm at my best doing that. And you're one of the best doing that. One of? Luke laughed lightly. Let me amend that. The best at dealing with strife. She turned her head and kissed him on the cheek. Thank you. Mind if I just relax here in your arms for a while? Sure. We have time. A day or two? Well, sure. But standing here for a couple of days will be a bit much, don't you think? Luke smiled. We could get faint from hunger. Oh, good point, husband mine. Perhaps we should go lie down. Definitely like the way you think, Mara. The Jedi Master hugged her just a bit tighter. Outside the viewport, a flock of triple-clawed manolium birds took off in a brilliant gush of color, to whirl and dive in a rainbow arc back down to another roost. Wow! With all the planning and everything that has been going on, I have had little time to stop and see what it is we're fighting to protect. I've been watching for hours, and there is always more to see. Mara turned within his arms and brought her arms up and around his neck. Rilal Tauren was very good for me. He told me that while the Mother Jungle is a peaceful place, it is not without violence and hostility. He noted that predators and prey are all part of the natural cycle. A predator kills prey and eats it. Then bugs and microbes devour what remains, nourishing plants that provide food and shelter for the prey. And he likened you to a predator? Mara shrugged. Actually, he likened me more to a firestorm burning a huge swath through the jungle during the dry years. Hmm. Didn't think they got that much news out here. Oh, Jedi sarcasm. I'm wounded. They both laughed aloud, and Luke kissed her again, on the lips and tip of her nose. He gave you a bit of perspective with which to view your role in the upcoming battle? Yes, one that allowed me to reconcile my nature with that of the Mother Jungle. And that's really the key. The Mother Jungle embraces it all because it is part of the natural cycle. What is unnatural about the Yuzhan Vong invasion, about war, is that it's not for natural reasons. Politics... Avarice, greed, jealousy, all of these things cause wars, but are pretty much unrecognizable in nature. They occur when creatures try to divorce themselves from nature. Luke smiled at her, 
and hugged her very close. That's one of the things I like the most about you, Mara. You're always on the move, always getting better and better. You continue to grow when so many would be content with sitting back. I can't sit back, Luke, especially now. Mara slipped from his arms. There are so many things I want, and with the invasion, with my illness, I don't know if I will ever be able to— Her lips flattened into a thin line. Then she took his left hand in hers. Maybe it's just all the talk of nature. But right now I really wish that we had— that I was carrying our child. I mean, I look at you and love you so much, Luke— and to even think that we might not be able to. She looked away from him, her other hand curling into a fist. Mara. He kept his voice soft as he closed with her, letting their joined hands rest on her belly. He brushed a tear away with his thumb, then kissed her moistened cheek. Love, we will get through this. I would love for nothing more than creating new life with you. One child, two, four. She pressed a fingertip to his lips. I know you have a lot to do right now, but I need you to be with me, just for a bit. Please? As long as you need, Mara, as long as you desire. A smile traced her lips. We both know there isn't that much time in the universe. I'll take what I can get now. We complete each other. We complete our connection with nature. And from there, we trust in the Force to guide us into doing what has to be done. Corin handed the last Duraplast container up to the bald, heavy-set man helping to load the pulsar skate. Looks like that's it. The man nodded. I'll secure the hatch and see to the passengers, then. Thanks for the help. No problem. Corin turned from him as the hatch irised closed and walked over to where Mirax was checking off the last of her passengers against the list in her data pad. All around them, the docking bay on the Athorian city ships bustled with activity. Countless ships, large and small, were loading refugees and equipment on as fast as they could. Once they cleared the bay, other ships would come and take their place. Throughout the city, and on all the other city ships, similar evacuations were taking place. The Jedi sidled up to his wife. Got them all? Uh-huh. She snapped the small device closed and slipped it into a thigh pocket on her cargo pants. We're fueled and about ready to go. Corin reached out and stroked her cheek with the back of his left hand. You know I don't want you to go. I know, but you don't want me here, either. Mirax smiled and jerked a thumb at the freighter behind her. I'm rolling this team out to Borlias. Climate there isn't quite optimal for Athorian plants, but they think they can make changes. I'm sure it will work. He slipped an arm around her shoulders. You going to be okay with this Chalco guy crewing the ship? From what I've seen so far, I think he's worth trusting. We deliver the cargo, then I drop him back on Coruscant. She leaned her head against Corin's shoulder. Then I'm coming back here. Mirax, don't. She turned to face him, pressing her hands against his chest. Hey, listen up, Corin. The last time you went off and fought the Yuzhan Vong, you barely escaped. And the time before that, you were more dead than alive when they brought you back. Mirax, having you here isn't going to keep me safe. Maybe not. But I can certainly kill whoever it is who gets you. Corin rested his hands on her shoulders. First, I'm not planning on dying. Very few people do. True. He sighed. Mirax, I don't want you here. The fighting is going to be nasty. What you're doing now, taking Athorians and their botanical bounty away, that's more important than anything I'm likely to accomplish here. You're going to be doing what you do well. And so will I. 
her brown eyes narrowed. The chances of my being killed are rather slender. I know. And I like that. He gave Anakin Solo a quick nod as the youth went running up the skate's landing ramp, then touched his forehead to his wife's. My grandfather died when my father was young, and I know you lost your mom young. I don't want that to happen to our kids. But the only thing worse would be if both of us die here. If we both die, Booster will take care of the kids. Now there's a comfort. She lifted his chin with her hand. Think of it as motivation to stay alive, Corin. He ducked his head to kiss her hand, then looked up, his smile carrying all the way from his mouth to his green eyes. I have motivation, love. And look at the record. The first time, they nearly killed me. The second time, I escaped in pretty good shape. Momentum and trajectory I've got. It's the Vong who should be worried. Mirax smiled grudgingly. You know, that cockiness of yours really drives my father nuts. But you love it. Well, when you were a pilot, it was attractive. She shrugged. In a Jedi Knight, well... Yes? Well, the Yuzhan Vong should take it as a warning. Mirax kissed him once, softly. Then her kiss hardened. Corin let his hands slip down and around her back to draw her into a tight embrace. In her kiss, in her body, he felt an urgency and intensity, fueled more by love than any sense of loss or fear. I will miss you, Corin, so much. Me too, Mirax. He clung to her fiercely. Through his mind flashed scenes from their life together, the first time he ever saw her her face as she slept peacefully in the wake of passion, the tears and smiles after the birth of their children, and even that spark of pain hidden behind an impassive mask as she watched a child try and fail, knowing that she could not make the failure right. I love you, Mirax. Always will. I know. She kissed him again, then smiled. You know... I'd love to take the next twelve hours to say goodbye to you properly, but they need the ship berth. Bureaucrats have no romance in their hearts. Corin kissed her again. Whatever you were thinking for us to say goodbye, figure that's how we'll say hello again, and take a week doing it. You have yourself a date. She kissed her fingers, then pressed them to his lips. Be careful, Corin. I know you'll be brave. Anakin found Chalco tightening the restraining straps on a couple of the Athorians in the skate's lounge. You weren't going to tell me you were leaving? Chalco patted the young Athorian on the shoulder, then turned to face Anakin. You've been busy doing Jedi stuff. I didn't want to interrupt. Mirax needed some help, and one thing flowed into another, you know? That explains why you're here, but not why you didn't say goodbye. The man frowned. Always said you were a smart kid. It's like this, Anakin. Chalco leaned down, resting his hands on the youth's shoulders. Going after Deshara Corps, I kind of wanted to be a hero. And you saw how that turned out. I went to rescue you, and you turned around and rescued me. I guess I figured, well... I'm not really hero material. Anakin frowned at him. Hey, you did rescue me. As you said, if you'd not brought the blaster, I'd not have taken Desharakor down. And you know, what you're doing here, helping these people escape, is heroic. Sure, maybe. But not the sort of heroism you're going to need. Chalco patted him on the cheek. Don't get me wrong. I'm happy I met you. Proud, in fact, to know a Jedi like you. I mean, we're friends, right? I'd like having a Jedi friend. And more important, I'd like having you as a friend. We're friends, Chalco. Good. Then look, my friend, 
The reason I'm getting my sorry carcass off this world is so there will be one less person that needs rescuing, okay? He smiled and straightened up. And I was planning to calm you, you know, leave you a message or something so we wouldn't get weepy and all. I believe you. Anakin smiled, then looked to his right as a comm link on a shelf started to beep. Should I? Chalco nodded. It's Corrin's. Anakin picked it up and answered. Anakin Solo here. Anakin, where's Corrin? Wedge Antilles' voice was easy to recognize even over the comlink. I thought I was connecting with his comlink. You did. He's outside with his wife. I can get him. It's okay. Tell him to wait there. I'm on my way to that docking bay anyway. Anakin frowned. What's the matter? A Yuzhan Vaughn cruiser showed up at the edge of the system and dumped out a shuttle. Its ID transponder registers as the one Olegos Akla took out to meet with the Yuzhan Vaughn. Wedge's voice became lower. All we're getting is a recorded message, playing over and over. It's from Olegos, to Corin, conveying to him the compliments of a Yuzhan Vaughn commander. Chapter 28 Jaina Solo watched the auxiliary landing bay on the Chimera from the pilot's ready room. From her vantage point, she was able to look down on the bay and the Lambda-class shuttle situated between two X-wings. She and Annie Capstan had been scrambled to recon the shuttle. Then a remnant shuttle had tractored it and dragged it to where the Chimera's bay tractor beams could haul it in. On her first recon pass, she had recognized the shuttle for what it was, but only just barely. The landing gear were extended, and the wings locked up. Because the shuttles were never seen in flight that way, it seemed out of place drifting there. That impression was aided by the fact that all sorts of growths covered the shuttle. Jaina made runs close enough for visual contact, to see if there was a pilot at the controls and the growths reminded her of algae and barnacles, just crusty things spreading over the shuttle's hull. A fairly thick concentration of them covered the landing ramp's outline, leading Jaina to wonder how the recovery team would open it. Once the shuttle was pulled into the landing bay, the X-wings were ordered to land. Then technicians in biohazard suits had hustled Annie and her from the bay. The both of them got scanned for alien life forms were pronounced clean, and allowed to wait in the ready room or head into one of the galleys to get something to eat. Annie ran off, and Jaina was fairly certain she'd have found a sabbat game somewhere and in no time at all would be stripping crew members of whatever the remnant used for credits. Jaina decided to stay and watch. She remembered Alagos well from traveling with him, her mother, and Danny before she joined the squadron. The quiet calm he possessed amazed her. It didn't seem so much that he ignored the outside world, or was able to override emotions through logic, but that he looked at any problem, saw the core of it, and dealt with that instead of getting detoured by distractions. In flying recon on the shuttle, she'd heard the continuous looping of Alagos's voice. It sounded normal, and even happy, but something about it disturbed her. She was hoping she'd see Alagos at the controls— or be able to sense him on board the shuttle. But nothing. Of course, before the appearance of the shuttle, she'd not known about Olegos's mission to the Yuzhan Vong, and she was pretty certain that part of her shock at learning about it was what was tainting her feelings about the shuttle. What they have done there is unusual. She turned as Jag Fell entered the pilot room. He wore a black flight suit with red stripes on the sleeves and legs. He wasn't as formal as he had been at the reception, but neither did he seem casual. Looking at him, she would have refused to believe he was Wedge's nephew, if not for the resemblance around the eyes and nose. Pretty much everything the Yuzhan Vong do is unusual, as far as I'm concerned. Gina folded her arms across her chest and looked back at the deck. They've spent an hour scanning the thing. I can't imagine there is much more they can learn without cracking it open. There isn't. That's not what they are doing. Fell came and stood beside her, 
his reflection easily visible in the transparisteel over the viewport. They don't know what is in there, and they're just making sure that if it's harmful, they don't get blamed for releasing it. You say that as if it's a bad thing to be cautious. He shook his head. They know they cannot be certain of what is in there. All they can do is reduce uncertainty to statistically insignificant levels. What they are wasting is time. We are at war. There is no absence of risk. There are times when one just has to do what needs to be done to win. Jaina turned and looked at him. In theory, you're only two years older than me. But you're talking like you're old enough to be my dad. He nodded once. Forgive me. I was judging you based on your accomplishments, not your age. She blinked and felt anger spike. What is that supposed to mean? The flesh around Fell's eyes hardened. You are a Jedi. You are a superior pilot in an elite squadron. The dedication and skill required for these things are well known. I made the mistake of assuming too much about you. Jaina frowned. I'm reading your tracking data, but still don't have a lock on your target. Jag Fell sighed. In Chiss society, there is no adolescence. Chiss children mature early and are given adult responsibilities very quickly. Those of us humans living with them were raised as they were raised. Intellectually, I knew things were not the same here in the New Republic, but you think I'm a child? Gina gave him an icy glare. You think I'm soft or something? Fell broke eye contact, and she noticed a blush rising on his cheeks. He raised a hand to ward off her comments, then shook his head. In doing that, he peeled off a decade or two and seemed to her for the first time to be someone his own age. Not soft. No, not at all. You have determination and courage, but you lack... Lack what? He frowned and glanced out at the shuttle. You're not grim. Jaina caught herself before she could proclaim that she was, in fact, grim. Grim enough to outgrim him, even. Um, no. I mean, there are times, yes. But being grim takes such a toll. It does, at that. He pointed a finger toward two men walking across the deck. They were wearing environment suits, but the clear headgear made them easily recognizable. My, uh, uncle, when he hugged me at that reception, we'd met barely an hour before, privately, and he was surprised to learn who I was. But in no time after that, where I come from, there are men that I have never seen smile before. And here he was in the midst of a difficult situation, and he was happy to meet me. Not because I was an ally, but because I was his sister's son. And he accepted me despite the fact that my mother's departure from the New Republic hurt him deeply. Gina reached out and rested a hand on Fell's shoulder. Wedge is like that. Most people are. Life is too harsh not to take what pleasure you can find in it. And certainly learning of his sister and how her life has gone would be wonderful to him. No matter how bad things might be, a joke, a smile, a pat on the back helped break the tension. Fell raised his chin, and Jaina could feel his defenses repairing themselves. Among the chess, celebration is saved until the job is done. Even if it is never-ending? If it isn't ended, the celebration is false. No, it's necessary. She looked at him, at his strong profile, at the determination on his face, and felt a shiver run down her spine. That he was handsome, there was no disputing. And the cockiness, which was backed by fantastic skill as a pilot, had its charm. She admired the way he'd stood up to the New Republic's politicians— most of whom disgusted her because of the way they treated her mother. Even the imperial formality was attractive in a quaint sort of way. I wonder if my mother saw my father that same way. The second that thought occurred to her, she pulled her hand back from Fell's shoulder abruptly. Oh, no, 
I am not going to let myself fall for some guy who thinks grim is the normal state of being. Not the time or place to even be thinking about it. Fell glanced over when she pulled her hand away, then half smiled. The Chiss, despite the impression I might have given you, are a thoughtful people. Deliberate, calculating, but not above a flight of fantasy or two. They are not averse to wondering where they would be had life been different, whom they would have met, how they would have met, what would have become of them. And you mention this because... Because... He hesitated, then looked out at the deck. I was wondering what Uncle Wedge would have thought of my older brother. Jana smiled and looked out at the deck. The only problem with those flights of fancy are that life never works as cleanly as we'd like. Sometimes a meeting is just a meeting. Other times it's a prelude. Fell laughed lightly. Had I said that, you would have accused me of talking as if I were your father's age again. I might well have, but probably not. She didn't glance at him, but did look at his reflection. The nice thing about being an adolescent is being able to make mature decisions when you need them, and being able to just flow along with life when you don't. Corin felt extremely uncomfortable in the environment suit. He was sweating, but wasn't hot, since the suit's cold temperature had him shivering. The way the growths on the shuttle changed its outline, the way scales trailed along edges, then blossomed into a gush of gray-brown mineral crusts, just had his flesh crawling. He glanced over at Wedge. You don't need to be here, Wedge. If anything happened to you, Iella and the kids would never forgive me. Oh, sure. And you think Mirax would forgive me if anything happened to you? Wedge laughed easily. You and me. Just like that trench run on Borleos. Except this time you go first. Didn't I get ordered out on that run? Yeah, you did. You going to pull rank on me here, Colonel? You'd listen to that order as well as I did. Corin shook his head. And you're not feeble-minded enough for some of the Jedi things to work. Okay. Glad you're on my wing. The two men approached the shuttle and walked to the area of the landing ramp. Tex had pulled up a wheeled set of steps that would allow one of them to climb up and touch the underside of the hull. A huge growth, looking to Corin a lot like a giant scab complete with that dark brown tinged with dried blood purple color, covered the whole landing ramp. The growth changed color over by the access panel, becoming lighter in color and a lot spikier. What do you think, Wedge? Well, your lightsaber ought to be able to core through the hull, but you never know what you're going to be cutting above. He folded his arms across his chest. Since this is being presented to you with the Yuzhan Vong commander's compliments, I'm not inclined to think he wants you carving up his handiwork. You're right there. Corin mounted the steps and took a close look at the growth covering the remote access panel. This growth is a lot sharper than the others, with some of the edges looking serrated. And there are spines, almost like needles. He raised a gloved hand toward the growth, and one of the spines shifted to orient toward it. In an eye blink, a slender needle shot out, but failed to penetrate the glove. Still, it hit with enough impact to knock Corin's hand back a couple of centimeters. Corin aided and abetted it by leaping backwards and found himself on the deck, with Wedge steadying him. You okay? Corin nodded. Yeah, I'm fine, he sighed. If you were to send someone a token of your esteem, you'd want to make sure he got it, right? You'd lock it up and give him some sort of combination or code to open it, wouldn't you? Makes sense. I was afraid of that. Corin freed his lightsaber from his belt with his right hand and ignited it, letting the silver blade splash cold highlights over the shuttle. He extended his left hand to Wedge. Take my glove off. 
I'm going to touch it with my bare hand. Something weird happens. The hand goes. Wedge frowned. Are you sure this is wise? Of course not, but I don't think I've got much choice. The green-eyed Jedi smiled. I left enough blood on Bimiel that the Vong have easily got samples. I'm betting that thing there is keyed to open when it gets another taste of me. The older man stripped the Jedi's left glove off. Wouldn't bleeding into a cup and offering that make more sense? I'm sure, in a non corellian sort of way. Corrin shrugged and climbed back up and raised his left hand toward the shuttle's belly. One of the spines shifted over and flicked a needle into his palm. It pulled back fast enough, and Corrin stared at the bead of blood rising from the little wound. Guess we should have thought about venom, shouldn't we? Before Wedge could answer, the edges of the scab cracked, with little brittle pieces of it falling to the deck to shatter like ice. Thick, glistening lines of mucus flowed from around the edges, linking the hull to the descending ramp. The lines stretched thin, then broke in the middle, half of it retracting to drip from the hull, the other slowly flowing into a sluggish crystalline pool on the deck. Corin climbed off the stairs and headed up the ramp, his lightsaber still lit. Wedge came close on his heels, with a blaster in his right hand. Save for some bioluminescent lighting, the shuttle remained dark, with the lightsaber's blaze deepening shadows and stretching them into grotesques as Corin waved it about. Throughout, the shuttle panels had been pulled open and smashed. Weird Yuzhan Vong growths, some like roots, others just coral spikes, decorated the interior hull. They spread out in an ivy-like pattern. But even as the two men entered the ship, the growths began to wither and sag. The external sheath and the long tendrils split, allowing black fluid to ooze out. Corin shook his head. I don't understand. I do. All that stuff was probably scanning us while we were scanning the shuttle. It was sending back information for as long as it took for the hull to be opened. Then it started dying, and dying so fast we aren't going to get anything useful out of analysis. Wedge pulled a piece of root from a wall, and it dissolved in his hand. Something is metabolizing this stuff very fast. It's like having a compost pile decaying at light speed. Well, if that's the message Shadow Shai wants to send me, I don't know how to take it. I mean, I'm not the Jedi who was a farm boy, and I'm not planning on dying that fast, thanks. Corin held his lightsaber high to spread the light out. Wait, what's this? Up toward the front of the passenger compartment, flush against the bulkhead that backed up to the pilot's compartment, sat a large and semi-ovoid shape, lying on its side. It had a seam running around the middle, parallel to the deck, and looked very much to Corin like the shell of a sea creature. It had a rough, tan exterior, with stripes running from the spine to fan out along the front edge. Another of the stony growths with spines sealed the seam at the front. As the two men approached it down the aisle between banks of seats, the villip perched on top of it took on the features of a Lagos. Though the protoplasmic ball lacked his golden down, it did take on a yellow hue, and even had purple streaks around the eyes. It looked much akin to a static holograph, where the lasers had been misaligned. Recognizable, but only barely. The villip began to speak in Alagos's voice. There is much I would tell you about the Yuzhan Vong, but I have little time. Shadao Shai has taught me much. The Yuzhan Vong are not mindless predators, but a complex species whose philosophy is much the antithesis of ours. I have not discovered the origin of their hatred for machines, but in other things I believe there is room for compromise. My mission to the Yuzhan Vong has been difficult, but not fruitless, and I have hopes for continued progress. 
The image molded onto the villa smiled. In our many discussions, Shadow Shai was especially intrigued by the tale of Grand Admiral Thrawn studying the art of the enemy and gleaning understanding from it. For you, Corin Horn, Shadow Shai has great respect. He knows you were at Bimiel. The two warriors slain there were kin of his. He knows you were at Garki. He believes the two of you will meet in the future. So he has prepared for you the enclosed, so you may study his handiwork as he has studied yours. Every day here, my understanding of the Yuzhan Vong grows, as does their understanding of us. Alagos's eyes softened. It is my hope that I will be again with you soon, in a time of peace. Please give my love to my daughter and friends. Fear not for me, Corin. Though difficult, this mission is vital if there is to be any chance at peace at all. At the message's conclusion, the villip condensed back down into a ball, then rolled off to the left and dropped to the decking. Corin looked over at Wedge and shivered. I don't think I like Shadow Shy thinking the folks on this side of the firing line are the same caliber of genius as Thrawn was. Wedge shrugged. Well, it might make him more cautious. And might make him come at us with enough force that even Thrawn would have run. The Jedi shook his head. Maybe we can talk the Vong into accepting some Nogri bodyguards. I don't think that's likely. Wedge nodded at the container. You going to open it? I guess. If Alagos had thought this was a trap... He would have found a way to warn me. Corin held his left hand above the seal and tightened it into a fist, letting a couple droplets of blood drip down onto the Yuzhan Vong device. The growth cracked slowly, then crumbled. The shell case slowly opened. The lightsaber's glow flashed from gold in the interior. Sith spawn! Corin felt his guts liquefy as he dropped to his knees. Oh, oh no. No. The opened case revealed a work of art that clearly had been the result of many hours lovingly lavished on it. A fully articulated skeleton sat cross-legged, each bone washed with gold. The sternum and the smooth caps at the end of long bones were gleamed with platinum. Scintillating violet gems burned in the hollows of the eye sockets. Amethysts had been powdered and layered onto the sides of the skull, flaring back in the exact pattern of Alagos's stripes. The teeth, polished white, grinned coldly in the lipless mouth. The Kamasi skeleton sat there, the head canted down to stare at the villip, nestled in the triangle described by its legs. That ball of tissue hardened into mismatched features. The voice that emerged from it came equally harsh and halting. Its command of basic was fine, but shaping its mouth around the sounds appeared to be difficult. I am Shadow Shai. You were at Bimiel. You slew two of my kinsmen and left them to be gnawed by vermin. You stole the bones of my ancestor. These bones here I present to you, so you may know the proper way to venerate fallen Yuzhan Vong warriors. The voice softened almost imperceptibly. I regret that your actions forced me to slay Alagos. I want you to know I did it myself, with my bare hands. As I strangled him, I read in his eyes betrayal. But only at the first. Before he died, he understood the necessity of his death. 
you must understand it as well. The Yuzhan Vong's eyes narrowed on the villip's surface. We will meet our respective forces at the world you call Ithor. If you have any honor at all, and Alegos assured me you did, you will return to me the bones of my ancestor. If you do not, then it is you who renders our friend's death meaningless. Corin felt Wedge's hands on his shoulders as the villip rounded itself again. The Jedi flicked off his lightsaber, sinking the cabin into darkness, all but hiding the skeleton displayed before him. He reached out with his left hand, seeking warmth, seeking something of Olegos's essence, but just felt cold. Wedge, he was... Olegos was so peaceful. He... he saved me and my sanity when I was with the pirates. He helped save Mirax. Corin hung his head. And his murderer tells me that his death is my fault? Alagos never did anything to hurt anyone, and is slaughtered to make a point? Wedge's hands tightened on Corin's shoulders. To the Yuzhan Vong, this was the only message they thought you would understand. Yeah. Well, this Shadow Shai made his point. Corin heaved himself to his feet. He wants those bones back? He'll get them. And in a big box, too. I'm going to pack his in with them. Then the Vong can carry the whole stinking lot back to wherever they call home. Chapter 29 the light from the holographic representation of the Athorian system splashed over the faces of the people gathered in the briefing room. Luke watched it shift and change as Admiral Crefe altered the perspective. The image's center soared out around Ithor in a spiral orbit, flashing past the city ships as they crept slowly away from what had been their home. The Bothan Admiral froze the image there. The evacuation is proceeding pretty well. The city ships are not structurally sound enough to make the jump to light speed, even if they could be fitted with hyperspace drives. We can and will keep them screened from the Vong force, while any ships we can round up will evacuate the people. Admiral Pelion nodded solemnly. I would have never thought it possible to evacuate a planet's entire population. Corin frowned. We've not got them all away. Not by a long shot. And there is plenty of life left behind on Ithor. We're just taking away the most mobile parts of it. Crefe nodded and glanced down at the data pad he was using to control the projector. Best estimates are that we need a week or so to complete the evacuation. But that's provided the extra shipping I've requested can get here. Already the price of passage from worlds like Agamar is spiking, so anyone with a ship that can haul a load is heading up there to get self-loading freight. It is a race against time, and the chances to win it are quickly slipping away. The Jedi Master sighed, the gravity of the Bothan's words weighing his spirit down. Nothing your cousin can do? Triest Quife laughed aloud. No, not really. His advisors fled back to Coruscant on one of the first ships to go. Corin arched an eyebrow in surprise. Borsk stayed behind? He did. The Corellian Jedi held both hands out, palms up, as if they were either side of a scale. Brave, stupid. Brave, stupid. Not sure which I want to believe of him. As long as he does not cause trouble, I don't care which it is. The Bothan sighed. Then again, the chances of his not causing trouble are minimal. And really immaterial. Pelion pressed his fingertips together. Our engineers have finished the work on the ground station. The defenders, such as they are, are in position. 
shells defending a shell, but it should be sufficient to fool the Vong. Luke nodded. Good. The Jedi are very close to finishing our preparations on the Tefanda Bay. I'd prefer more time to make sure things will work properly, run some simulations, but we go when we go. It's really up to the Yuzhan Vong. It is that, definitely. Kweifei hit a button on his datapad, and the viewpoint's spiral continued on out in a long arc toward the depths of the solar system. There, nestled between an asteroid belt and a gas giant, sat the Yuzhan Vong fleet. The ships almost appeared to be a group of asteroids, slowly leaving the belt to orbit the gas giant, but their course pointed inexorably in toward Ithor itself. The fleet's image sent a chill down Luke's spine. The Bothan Admiral sat back and smoothed the white fur on his neck with both hands. Ever since they showed up in the system, I've been running dozens of simulations of the probable course of battle. With the forces allotted to both sides, the outcome is fairly consistent. We engage in space, inflict damage on each other, then retreat to the opposite sides of the world. At their current rate of advance, we engage in three days, perhaps four. One big battle, then a standoff. Gilad Pelion leaned forward and smoothed his mustache with thumb and forefinger. I've requested reinforcements, and I know you have too. What I don't like about the simulations I've run is this. The Vong can peel off a small contingent of their ships and send them after the city ships once we've settled into our standoff. We have to react, shifting the balance of power here. Ithor will be open to them. Corin's green eyes narrowed. Can these reinforcements come into the system in a position to cover the city ships? The Imperial Admiral nodded. That would be relatively simple to accomplish, and would put them in position to help with the evacuation, too. And the evacuation is more important than killing any Yuzhan Vong splinter force. Luke looked at Corin. What is it? The Corellian Jedi blinked, then glanced down at his hands. Well, it sounds as if what we really need, instead of just a standoff, is a truce. Pelion nodded. That would be most useful. But the fate of your Kamasi friend would suggest it's unlikely. Maybe not. Luke looked hard at Corin as a spiked wave of conflicting emotions erupted from the dark-haired Jedi. What do you have in mind? You've been planning something. Caught red-handed. Corin's lips pressed into a flat line. I didn't mean to deceive you, Luke. I know that's not possible, but... You all heard what Shadow Shai said to me. I sent a message to Agamar. A day from now, I expect to get those bones from the archaeological team that recovered them. I'll have something Shadow Shai wants. Luke shook his head. You weren't planning something stupid, were you? Were you going to bring them to the Tefanda Bay and use them as bait? I don't know what I was thinking. I hadn't gotten as far as planning. Corin looked at his open hands, then pressed them flat on the tabletop. I just knew. I mean, I knew I had to have those bones here. Maybe I'd shoot them into the sun and tell Shadow Shai I'd done that so he'd race his ship into the sun's gravity well trying to get them, and then get all burned up. I don't know. Crefe scratched at his chin. Trade the bones for a truce? I'm not sure that would work. Corin shook his head. It wouldn't. Luke heard the uncertainty leave Corin's voice. What do you mean? I was wrong when I said I had something Shadow Shai wants. I have two things. I have the bones, and I have me. I killed two of his kin on Bimiel, so he killed the Lagos. He wants to kill me. The Imperial Admiral slowly smiled. And you want to kill him? 
I wouldn't mind it. The Corellian Jedi's head came up. What I propose is this. I challenge the Vong leader to a duel. He wins, he gets the bones. I win, I get Ithor. To set it up, we have a truce. How long do you want? A week? Two? A week would be great. Two would be better. Crefe nodded. This could work. Luke shook his head. No, this can't happen. Master, why not? First, Borsk Thalia will never agree to it. Crefe cleared his throat. What my cousin does not know will not hurt him. Corin nodded. And if it does not work, if Shadow Shai does not agree, we don't have to explain yet another Jedi failure. Corin, it's still not right. You challenge him to a duel, you become the aggressor. You're coercing him into acting. That's not what Jedi do. You're treading perilously close to the dark side, my friend. Luke did not voice his concern, because he wasn't at all sure how either Admiral would take it. The green-clad Jedi sat silently for a moment, then slowly nodded. I think I understand your concern, Master. But this goes back to the discussion at our meeting months ago. I can feel the focusing of Vong power. I know that to do this is to preempt Vong action. Alagos sent himself out to try to stop the invasion. And, um, if I can do that, even for a day, the chances of more people escaping goes up. It may not be the choice we want to make, but it's the only one that seems to be offering itself at the moment. But the example you'll set, you'll be playing into Kip's hands. I know. Corin closed his eyes and sat back. I wish there was another way, Master. But this one just feels right. Luke wanted to protest and forbid Corin from striking the bargain with the Yuzhan Vong leader that had been proposed. He didn't because of the sense of calm radiating from his colleague. The Jedi Master looked at the two military men. You two approve of this plan? Pelion snorted. Of one man taking a vigilante action to decide the fate of a planet and its population? That's the last thing the Empire would ever condone. Not only is it risky for the man on the spot, but it would encourage others to act in an insubordinate fashion if they felt their action was right. Were he under my command, I would forbid this action. But he's not. I also recognize how absolutely desperate things are, and if this will work, I'm willing to work with it. The decision is going to be up to his commanding officer. Admiral Crefe frowned. I seem to remember there having been a good reason for recalling Colonel Horn to active duty, but it escapes me now. He sighed. I agree with Admiral Pelion. I don't like this at all, but I think this is a chance we must take. Ships can only move so fast, so we need to win time more than the battle. At the very least, this will win us time. If it safeguards Ithor, so much the better. Luke nodded solemnly. There is a great deal I don't like about this. But... He glanced at Corin. I trust your judgment. I know you will do the right thing. Thank you, Master. Luke reached out and patted Corin on the shoulder. We'll work out a way to get the message to Shadow Shai. I will get you the plans as soon as we have them. Crefe stood and offered Luke his hand. Just in case it never gets said, I appreciate the sacrifice you and your Jedi are making here. I wanted you to know that, in case we don't make it through to the other side of this conflict. The image of Chewbacca flashed through Luke's mind for a second. Then he banished it with the sensation of meeting the Bothan's firm, dry grip. Thank you, Admiral. May the Force be with us all. 
Chapter 30 Jason Solo watched the freighter captain accept the data pad back from Corin, check the receipt flashing on the screen, then wave forward the binary load lifter with the brushed aluminum case. You should know that Dr. Pace said she was going to protest this appropriation of Yuzhan Vong artifacts to the highest levels. The captain shook his head. Noted. Corin gave the man a curt nod. Thanks for the diversion here. I won't keep you. Not a problem. Your wife's done me some good turns in the past. Glad to return the favor. The man gave Corin a quick salute, then directed the load lifter back to his freighter. Want me to get that, Corin? The elder Jedi hefted the case by its handle, then extended it toward Jason. Has your mind changed about this? You didn't like the idea at the briefing. Second thoughts? Jason accepted the case and was surprised by how light it really was. Not really. You're making part of this war personal. You against Shadow Shai. That's not right. It's divisive. It's of the— Don't tell me it's of the dark side, Jason. Corin held up a hand and shook his head. I'm not in a mood. Yes, you are, Corin. You're in a mood. And you don't want to hear it because you know it's true. Jason got a step ahead of the other Jedi, glancing back at him over his left shoulder. You're the one who told me we all have to be pulling in the same direction. But you're going off on your own. You want revenge for your friend. I can't blame you for that. But were the situation reversed, you'd be arguing with me to subordinate my feelings to what others thought was best. That's probably true. So why doesn't the same work for you? Because... Corin frowned, then grabbed a handful of Jason's tunic and tugged him down a side corridor. Come here. The two of them walked along in silence and emerged on a walkway that gave them a view across the expanse of the bowl that was the Tafanda Bay. Had Jason not known they were floating over the Mother Jungle, he could have easily been led to believe that the Athorian ship was a domed city nestled comfortably on the planet below. The transparisteel dome displayed a bright blue sky, through which freighters streaked toward space, and the verdant foliage throughout the city let the white walls and walkways peek through only here and there. Look out there, Jason. This is a city that is now abandoned by the people who love it, who labored to create it. Why? Because it's a target. We know the Vong are going to hit it. So we've moved the people and have rigged up some surprises for the enemy. We're doing that on the planet itself, too. The youth nodded. I understand that. Well, understand this. Shadow Shai, because of what I did at Bimiel, because of what we did at Garki, has decided I'm a target. He's going to be looking for me, and for the bones in that case which means he's going to be distracted. That's what we want, because a distracted leader is one who will give us some time, and ultimately is going to fail. I get that, but the rest of it... Corin sighed and laid a hand on Jason's left shoulder. Look, Jason, I don't want revenge for Alagos. His death hurt me, deeply but I knew him well enough to know that the last thing he'd want is someone slain in his name. You remember on Dantooine, he took to flying that shuttle because he was willing to take responsibility for killing, to shield others from having to bear that burden. If I went out after Shadow Shai in Alagos's name, Alagos would see that as his having thrust the burden of violence on me. I wouldn't do that to him. But you do intend to kill Shadow Shai. Corin's face resolved itself into a solemn mask. If the opportunity arises, yes. Look, Jason, it's not about vengeance, which you're right, would be of the dark side. It's about responsibility. Shadow Shai wants to kill me. If I don't engage him, then you or Ganner or someone else might be required to deal with him. 
Yes, he's dangerous. Of that I have no doubt. He may well kill me. And then he's your problem. Until then, he's mine. Jason shivered. I don't know about that. Yeah, but you don't have to. The older man sighed, not wearily, but as if he were letting tension boil off. I know what we are doing is right, Jason. The battle here is for two ends. The first is to preserve Ithor and its fleeing population. The second, which is equally important, is to inflict a defeat on the Vong. We need them to know the easy course of their invasion so far isn't going to continue. If they pay a price here, they may reconsider further action. I don't expect you to understand it at your age, because I didn't until well past it. But I just know that what I'm doing is right. He smiled. I can feel it in my gut. It's just what has to be done. Jason heard the conviction in Corin's voice and took heart in it for a second, then frowned as his mouth soured. I felt that way about freeing the slaves on Belkaden, and you know how that turned out. Corin looped an arm over Jason's shoulders. Um, kid, you've got a lot to learn about this morale thing. Just trying to be realistic. Yeah, I know. Corin smiled grimly and steered Jason along to their staging area. I have a feeling we're going to get realism washed over us in waves. I just hope we don't drown. Indeed, I am rather surprised to see you still here, cousin. Admiral Triest Crefe stood forward on the Ralroost's bridge, watching the spacescape over Ithor. Out in the distance, a number of dagger-shaped ships orbited the planet with fewer of them belonging to the New Republic than to the Imperial Remnant. I would have thought you'd have made your way back toward the core with High Priest Torin. Borsk Thalia avoided shrugging, though fur did ripple at the back of his neck. There were reasons I stayed. Not the least being that Leia Organa Solo has not fled as your cabinet has. Triest left his thoughts unvoiced though he felt the chief of the New Republic might have read them in his feral smile. And reasons you wish to speak to me? Speak to you? No. Failure smiled carefully. I wanted you here as a witness. He nodded toward the communications officer. You may put the connection through now. Lieutenant Arica looked to the Admiral for permission. Trieste held a hand up for a moment. And whom do you want to speak with? Admiral Pelion. Thalia nodded toward the chimera glimmering in the distance. Since you are not so bold as to champion your own cause, it becomes incumbent upon me to do so. I will demand the leadership of this operation fall to you. It is a new Republic world. You should be leading its defense. I see. A hint of a growl entered Triest's voice. Then he nodded to the lieutenant. Open communications with Admiral Pelion, please. The two Bothans waited in silence for a handful of seconds. Then Pelion appeared in life-size hollow, as imposing as he did in life. Yes, Admiral Crefe. My compliments, Admiral. I did not want to disturb you, but Chief Borsk Felia wishes to urge you to give me command of the Athorian defense. Before he did that, I thought I would let him hear your orders concerning the matter. The human nodded and smoothed his white mustache with his left hand. As per Imperial Directive 59826, if I am replaced as commander of the Athorian defense, all Imperial ships and personnel are to be withdrawn to Bastion immediately. Thank you, Admiral. Sorry for wasting your time. Crefe out. The Bothan Admiral turned to face his cousin. Will that be all? He could see by the crest of fur rising at Borskfelia's neck that it would not be. 
This is an outrage. The Remnant has no place defending this world. It is our world. We must be in command of the defense. There can be no other way. Triast extended his right hand toward Felia, palm up, fingers clawed, and unsheathed his talons. On Coruscant, you agreed to leave the defense of the New Republic to the military. I warned you that if you tried to interfere, I would withdraw my forces to the unknown regions. I can and will yet do that. If I do, Admiral Pelion will pull his forces out. Ithor will be defenseless. Failure's violet eyes widened. But you can't. The troops you have on the ground would be abandoned. And the Jedi, you would not leave them. No. Try me. You don't care about the Jedi. If you had your way, they would all perish here. You'd praise their sacrifice, build memorials to them, then happily dance on their graves. Triest's amethyst eyes hardened, letting light glint from the gold flecks in them. As for leaving Ithor behind, you have no idea where I've sent the refugees. There will be Ithorian colonies throughout the New Republic and unknown regions. Yet it will take years before the Bathor trees can produce their pollen again. But I can spend that time building up armies to come and crush the Yuzhan Vong. I warned you before that is what I would do, and I will. One word from me, and the dependence for every warrior in my command will be moved to worlds of my choosing. You are insubordinate. I will remove you from command. Failure turned and pointed at two Bothan security officers, standing beside the access hatch to the bridge. Arrest Admiral Crefe, and conduct him from the bridge. Neither of the Bothans stirred, or gave any sign they'd even heard the command. Triest peered down his nose at his cousin. We are in a war zone, cousin. Your power ended when you entered this system. You have a choice... He was cut off by Pelion's sudden holographic appearance. Forgive me, Admiral, but the Vong have reached attack range. They have launched. We have incoming. It has begun. Case 7, it appears. Thank you, Admiral. Case 7, it is. Triest looked through the Imperial's vanishing hologram. Case 7! Slave our targeting computers to telemetry from the Chimera. Scramble all fighters. This is not a drill, people. Fight well, and we'll live to see the Yuzhan Vong repulsed. Triest stepped in close to Felia and dropped his voice to a whisper. The choice I was going to offer you was to return to your quarters, or to get on a ship and flee before the enemy deployed its forces. That latter choice is gone now. But I offer you another. You can remain here on the bridge and silently show your support for those who will fight to save your life. Or you can slink away in terror and hope the Yuzhan Vong attacks never breach your cabin's bulkheads. Felio lifted his chin. You may have contempt for me now, cousin. But in my day, when Imperials were our enemies, I spilled blood. I've known combat, and I've not run from it. Good, because the Yuzhan Vong are worse than anything you ever faced. Triest raised his voice so everyone on the bridge could hear him. Yes, cousin, your help here would be wonderful. If there is a need, I will let you know what to do. Until then, just having you here, honoring my staff with your presence is more valuable to our effort than you could know. Gina Solo's X-Wings sailed out high above the Raal Roost and rolled left to come into position within Rogue Squadron's formation. Annie Capstan dropped in on her starboard S-foil and drifted back a couple of meters. A quick glance at the displays showed her screens up at full. Her inertial compensator field expanded to protect them from Yuzhan Vong Dovin Basils, and her weapons systems fully charged in green. Eleven, hot and green. Sparky hooted 
and started painting tactical data on her primary monitor. In an eye blink, a dozen Yuzhan Vong targets scrolled past. The monitor displayed a huge Yuzhan Vong cruiser, bigger than anything she'd seen before. It bristled with long spines of Yorick coral, though the core of it seemed to have started life as an asteroid onto which the other pieces had been grafted. Three smaller cruisers, all the size of the ship they'd fought at Dantooine, surrounded the largest cruiser. Then eight more ships were positioned in support of the rest. From all of them boiled skips, forming a cloud of contacts. Through all that, Sparky managed to pick up a series of medium-sized ships that Jaina took to be troop carriers. Fleet Command immediately downloaded tactical designators for the Yuzhan Vong ships. The biggest was designated a Grand Cruiser. The smaller ones became assault cruisers, and the smallest were tagged light cruisers. The quick chat designators of Grand, Salt, and Light were appended to the files, though Jaina assumed the pilots would come up with their own designators just to spite the tactical planners. The troop carriers earned the name Crate. Jaina knew they had to be jam-packed full of Yuzhan Vong warriors. The soldiers would be helpless until they got into atmosphere and on the ground, and an attack on them didn't need to destroy the crate, just open the hull enough to let the atmosphere out and cold in. Gavin's voice crackled over the comm channel. Rogues, we have the crates. Lasers if you can, torps if you can't. Better us killing them up here than having them on the ground. Chapter 31 It's huge, Admiral. It masses as much as a super star destroyer. Pelion turned slowly away from the viewport on the Chimera's bridge. Knowing he would win the battle as much by the demeanor he showed his crew as he would by firepower or tactics. We'll have to see, Commander, if we can trim mass from it, shall we? The Chimera sat in the center of the defender's formation, deep in the well of a cone. Arrayed around and ahead of it were four other Imperial class star destroyers, two each from the New Republic and the Remnant. Then nine Victory-class Star Destroyers, three Bothan Assault Cruisers, and a Moan Calamari Star Cruiser ranged out further along the cone. Beyond them came a scattering of smaller ships, from frigates on down to a couple of freighters with more guts in the crew than weapons on the hull. Firing solutions for the Grand, please. Fire at will! The Imperial Admiral turned and watched the turbolasers' batteries on either of the ship's flanks fill space with hot red bolts of energy. Some of the weapons emitted a nearly constant stream of small bolts that sprayed back and forth at the target. The voids the Yuzhan Vong used to shield their ships sucked them up greedily, though when a few began to get through, the other guns unleashed a concentrated torrent of fire. Those heavier bolts flashed in at their targets. Pelion expected them to hit and melt gaping holes in the Grand's rocky hull. But voids swallowed those bolts as well. The Admiral's eyes narrowed as he studied the large ship's ability to absorb the punishment his guns were doling out. No good, sir! The weapons control officer let frustration bleed into his words. These snubfighter tactics may work against skips but not against the big ships. They have enough shielding to hold us off. That's possible. Quite possible. Pelion frowned and ran his right hand over his chin. Or have they learned how we fight? Jaina scattered laser fire over a skip, then drilled a quad burst into its aft. Coral slagged off into a frozen comet tail. The dark little Yuzhan Vong ship started to roll, and began on a course that would burn it into a golden streak high in Ithor's atmosphere. Styx, break starboard! Without thinking, Gina reacted to Annie Capstan's warning. She jerked her stick to the right and feathered the adjustment jets to pitch the X-wing into a barrel roll to starboard. A plasma blast from a skip sizzled past her ship. Then, hot after it, came molten chunks of coral skipper. Annie's fighter blazed through. Sparks still trailing from her shields. 
and Jaina dropped onto her aft, then slipped slightly to port. They exchanged fire with a pair of skips, then blew through the Yuzhan Vong screen to get in among the crates. In comparison to the fast-moving skips, the crates were bloated floaters, just inviting a quick run and a pair of proton torpedoes. Each of the troop carriers sprouted horn-like projections that spat plasma bolts at incoming fighters. But they were clearly meant more for anti-personnel use than anti-fighter tactics. Dodging the streams was easy, and a burst of splinter shots actually scored some hits on the hull. Sparky, watch our tail. We're making a run. Jaina slipped her X-wing back into the lead, then leveled out and started in on one crate. As it fired plasma toward her, she abruptly kicked her X-wing up on its port S-foil and dived down at another. She snapped off two bursts of splinters fore and aft, then drilled a quad burst into the boxy craft's spine. Coral went from coal black to white hot in an instant, then evaporated. Got it! Gina keyed her comlink. Finish it, Twelve! As ordered, Sticks! Suddenly, Sparky started shrieking. Jaina's secondary monitor showed a pair of skips lurking dead center in her aft scope, slipping in behind Annie. Twelve! Break off the run! Sith spawn! Annie's voice rose with panic. I'm hit! Jaina jerked her stick to starboard and pulled back to climb, but it was too late. Annie's X-wing trailed flames from two engines. The fighter had tucked itself into a tight spiral, and slammed full force into the crate Jaina had shot up. Jaina caught a pulse of pain from her wingmate, and then nothing. Annie! Jaina! Down on Ithor, hidden with the Jedi squad waiting for the Yuzhan Vong, Jason doubled over as pain exploded in his stomach. He struggled for breath, feeling as if a vibroblade had been shoved into his guts. The physical pain in his middle slowly began to ease, but not so the heartache flooding through him. In an instant, Corrin was beside him, his hand on Jason's back. What is it? Jason coughed a couple of times, then caught his breath. My sister, she's... something happened. Up there. How bad? Jason blinked and reached out with the Force, then raised his face to the night sky. He could still feel her out there amid the flashes of laser fire and the golden debris streaking across the sky. She's okay, but someone close to her got vaped. I get that much very clearly. Corin nodded. Then he and Ganner slapped Jason on the back. You'll have to figure she'll be safe. Why's that? Because, Jason, Ganner offered, there's nothing you can do for her down here. We'll just make sure that what comes down isn't going back up again to bother her. The youngest Jedi nodded. You think they're going to take the bait? Do glit biters suck spice? Corin gave Jason a confident smile. The Vong have managed to surprise all of us a number of times. It's their turn to be surprised. And a nasty surprise it will be. With his head ensconced in a cognition hood, Dane Leon surveyed the battle. He had chosen to color the carrier bearing Shadow Shai red, and watched as the enemy fighters broke through Coral Skipper cover to start shooting up the carriers. Their weapons spat hot light at Shadow Shai's ship, but none hit. The outer shell of carriers was gradually carved away, but the majority of them hit atmosphere and began their descent into the night side of the planet. Leon then turned his attention to the fleet battle. In an eye blink, he designated one of the small infidel ships as a target. The legacy of Torment's gunners focused on it, launching a salvo from a half-dozen plasma cannons— the first shot to hit the ship splashed around its shield like mud on an egg. The subsequent shots, all golden and boiling, ate through it like acid. The last one blew unabated through the ball that had once been a metal construct in which warriors had huddled. More infidels to feed the gods! With a flicker of thought, Dane Leon shifted the representation of the battle. 
Instead of seeing it as it might appear in visual light, the torment's analytic neuroengines layered colors over the images, letting him assess the damage done to the fleet. Coral skippers became gold and red sparks flitting through the void, growing darker until they winked out of existence. The larger ships started gold, but took on reddened spots or stripes. It pleased him that so few of his ships were reddened. That pleasure faded quickly, as he realized that Shadow Shai was the reason for their successes. His superior had analyzed the infidel's small fighter tactics, and anticipated the capital ships using a version of them. His counter-tactic of deploying a Dovin basal screen of sufficient strength to pick off the weakened shots succeeded in conserving energy for the intense fields needed to arrest the full power shots. It does not matter. He might win today, but his victory will just blind him to what needs to be done in the future. Dane Leon smiled. And if he loses, to him goes all blame, and to me will fall the glory of having made the best of his feeble plan. Colonel Gavin Darklighter rolled to starboard, then spiraled down after the escaping crates. Got my wing, Deuce? Kral Neville double-clicked his comm, replying in the positive. Gavin checked his scopes and found six more rogues coming on hot. Only eight of us left? A shudder shook him. At once he was happy that so many of the rogues were still operational, but the losses still sent icy tendrils through his guts. Annie gone, and others whom I never got a chance to know. He snarled angrily, then felt his mind go very cold and clear, as his fury became arctic and infused his body and mind. He suddenly felt as if he was more than a pilot in a machine— that somehow he and his fighter had become one, as closely linked as a Vong pilot and his machine. He let his right hand ride lightly on the stick, despite the bump of entering the atmosphere, and cruised on in after one of the crates. Gavin sailed in at its aft, and scattered splinter shots at it. The crate projected a void that swallowed the red darts. Then its aft guns started spitting plasma sparks at him, the New Republic pilot took his fighter down enough that the crate's own voids shielded him from the fire. Then he laced the carrier's belly with splinter shots. The void shifted down to pick off those shots, and the plasma fire resumed. Gavin smiled and tugged back on his stick. His nose came up just enough to pulse a quad burst at the crate's aft. The lasers hit it hard, with one carving a black furrow up along the side. The other three burned holes in the back. Gavin followed them with more splinter shots, not figuring they'd do more damage to the carrier, but every one that got through the hole would wreak havoc on the cargo. That crate broke left and below. Gavin ignored it and brought his X-wing around on the same heading as the rest of the crates. In the distance gleamed a white building complex nestled amid the jungle, and twenty kilometers north of it, the lone remaining herd ship, the Tafanda Bay, rode in the sky like a peaceful metal cloud. Four of the crates broke off for the herd ship, while the rest bore in at the ground target. Gavin flicked his weapons control over to proton torpedoes and targeted the space between two of the crates heading for the Tafanda Bay. He glanced at his monitor and read the range to target. Catch! Program the torps for detonation at two clicks, or proximity void detection. The droid beeped once, solidly. Then Gavin hit the trigger. The paired missiles burned blue through the sky, and his sensors reported voids appearing behind the crates. The Yuzhan Vong had clearly learned the proton torpedoes would go off when they detected a void, so these crates projected their voids far behind them. In space, the amount of energy from the blast would be insignificant at that range. But we're not in space, are we, boys? The exploding proton torpedoes did two things. The first was to pulse out a shock wave that traveled faster than the speed of sound and pushed a lot of atmosphere in front of it. 
That dense chunk of air slammed into the two crates, boosting them forward and starting them to tumble. It raced past, dissipating as it went, but even the two leaders were bounced around a bit. The second thing the explosions did, by superheating air and blasting it out in all directions, was to create a void that a lot of air rushed in to fill. The resulting turbulence whirled the spinning crates around. Gavin had no idea how the Yuzhan Vong pilots and the living components of their ships were able to track up, down, direction, speed, or altitude. But he knew that at the heart of a whirlwind, he'd have had a hard time thinking about any of that. Apparently, so did the Yuzhan Vong. Their ships fell from the sky, careening through the jungle. No explosions resulted from their impacts, though trees toppled, scarring the dark canopy. Gavin watched them fall, then focused on the rest of the crates. They were already quite far and quite low, and too close to the herd ship to risk another proton torpedo shot. He smiled to himself. Did what we could to slow them down. Now they're not our problem. Chapter 32 The first Yuzhan Vong carrier swooped in at the Tafanda Bay and pulled away sharply at the last moment. The herd ship, which had no guns, presented no obvious threat to the invaders. The second carrier came in level and blazed away with the two small plasma cannons mounted on the cockpit's roof. Golden gouts of plasma slammed into the transparasteel of a viewport, melting it like ice beneath a blowtorch. The carrier then used a void, centering it on the hull, to suck molten transparasteel away. The void pulled in some atmosphere, tree branches, and small uprooted plants by the time it had cleared out a hole big enough to let the carrier land. The boxy ship entered the Tafanda Bay and moved forward to a green promenade. It touched down lightly, opening hatches through which poured a legion of little reptoid shock troops. From the ship's aft emerged a half-dozen Yuzhan Vong warriors, all tall, lean, and terrible. They bore their amphistaffs and wore armor, but it hung loosely on them. They seemed to move uneasily in it, and as Anakin Solo watched them alight from the ship, he supposed their uneasiness came from wearing the dead shell of a creature instead of the living Von Doon crab itself. He studied the small screen on his datapad occasionally hitting a key to provide himself another view from one of the many holocams located throughout the city. He switched to the one nearest where the first crate had landed and caught the quick flash of something before static filled the little data window. Another view showed two Yuzhan Vong warriors pointing at the smoking, sparking ruin of a holocam. One of the warriors plucked a flat, disc-shaped bug from a bandolier he wore across his chest and sent it whirling out toward the cam through which Anakin watched them. Anakin flinched, having felt the sting of the razor bugs on Dantooine. The toss missed, but the bug came flying back to its master for another try. Anakin switched to yet a third cam, but the landing of the second crate cut off his view of the warrior throwing the bug. Desharakor rested a hand on his left shoulder. It's time, Anakin. He shut the data pad off and started to pocket it, but she turned and looked at him. Leave it. No reason to drag it along. The remark surprised him for a second. She was right. He didn't need it for what they would be doing. In fact, it would be a little extra weight, something that might slow him down. If they defeated the Yuzhan Vong, he would have all the time in the world to come back for it. If we don't... He smiled, then slipped the data pad into the pocket on the left thigh of his combat suit. The Yuzhan Vong hate machines. It's not a living thing, but I don't want to leave it for them. The Twi'lek smiled briefly. Hadn't thought of that. Come on, Anakin. Let's go teach them the error of their ways. Anakin stalked after Desharakor slipping through a broad doorway and into a wide corridor. Planters mounted into the walls brimmed over with purple vines, while gold-leaf ivy ran along the ceiling. Desharakor walked down the center of the passage, 
which, because it had been built for Athorians, was sufficiently large to make her look almost childlike. He wondered for a moment why she was walking down the middle of the corridor. He knew she wasn't afraid of the vines. Then he noticed he was doing it too. Neither of us is slinking along. Approaching the coming battle boldly hardly made sense, since the Yuzhan Vong were lethal. But to cower as we approach would give them a victory even before the battle is joined. Irrational though he knew that explanation was, it felt right to him. Watching her, seeing the set of her shoulders and the straightness of her spine, he realized that to be truly brave took more than deciding you weren't going to be scared. You had to allow yourself to believe you were brave, and you had to do all the things you could to promote that feeling. You have to give yourself the chance to be brave. They reached the end of the corridor and crouched down. The corridor connected with a large series of forested plazas that ran down the belly of the herdship about three levels above the greensward. The reptoids had spread out in little knots of six, moving along the walkways that edged the plazas. Anakin knew the Athorians had not been taking tactics into account when they created the herdship. Still, the fact that the walkways curved often and moved up and down, as if the path were on a hillside, meant that the Yuzhan Vong troops could pretty much see only twenty meters in front of them, and that in the best case. And the foliage choking the greensward made looking from one side of the herd ship to the other almost impossible. That mattered little to the Jedi. Though they could not sense the Yuzhan Vong themselves, their client troops had a presence in the Force. Moreover, the Jedi could pick one another out within the city. While none of them had direct telepathic connections, having a sense of where someone was and a comm link for talking to them was almost as good as a brain-to-brain -brain hookup. Desharakor keyed her comm link. Team 12 in place. Copy 12. Race starts in five. The Twi'lek nodded to Anakin. She brought her lightsaber to hand and covered the ignition button with her thumb. Anakin, I just want to say thanks. He frowned. What for? I got myself lost before, and you found me. Desharakor smiled. That's a debt so huge I can't repay it. If I had succeeded, I'd have hated myself. Forever. Anakin's reply died amid the electronic squealing of an MSE-6 mouse droid rolling along the walkway as fast as it could. Guttural barks and hisses chased it. It paused just in front of the corridor where they waited, spun in a tight circle, then shot on down the walkway past them. Pursuing hotly came a half-dozen reptoids. So focused were they on the small droid that none of them even spared a glance at the corridor. Anakin flicked his left hand at one of the middle reptoids and used the force to boost it into the air. The Yuzhan Vong slave caught its heels on the walkway balustrade, starting the creature somersaulting in flight. Screaming, it crashed through foliage and landed with a crunch below. The surprised look on the second reptoid's face died as Anakin slammed his lightsaber against the side of its head, then hit the ignition switch. The purple blade swept up through the top of the creature's skull, then came around to parry an amphistaff strike from one of the two lead reptoids. With two hands on the hilt, Anakin parried the amphistaff wide to his left, then pivoted on his left foot and sidekicked the reptoid in the face. As that creature pitched backwards, the other one lunged with his amphistaff at Anakin. The young Jedi felt the fire of the Amphistaff's sharpened edge grazing the inside of his left thigh. Anakin whipped his lightsaber around in a backhanded slash that separated the reptoid's triumphant grin top from bottom. Spinning back, he saw Desharakor standing above the bodies of her dead reptoids. Then the two of them went over the balustrade and dropped to the level below. Anakin landed astride the reptoid he'd pitched off the upper level. It had clearly shattered its spine in the fall. Anakin turned to his right and saw a Yuzhan Vong warrior coming along the walkway. Quick! The corridor! Go! 
the Sharakor darted down the corridor that ran below the one in which they'd hidden, and Anakin made to follow her. But the reptoid clutched at his right ankle. He tried to shake his foot free, but the creature clung to it for dear life. The Yuzhan Vong roared a challenge, and charged, his amphistaff whirling. Turning to face this challenge, Anakin set himself as best as he was able. He raised his lightsaber to a guard, and was ready to parry the warrior, when the reptoid slammed a fist into the wound on his left leg. Pain shot up through him, dropping him to one knee. He looked up and saw the bladed end of the amphistaff slashing down at his face. Suddenly, Anakin felt himself jerked back by the force, as strongly as if he'd been strapped to an X-wing making the jump to light speed. Her lightsaber burning scarlet, Desharakor stepped onto the walkway, interposing herself between the Yuzhan Vong and Anakin. The warrior, whose strike had carved through the reptoid instead of Anakin, dropped back into a half-crouch, with his amphistaff held waist-high, the bloodied tail pointing at the Twi'lek. The Yuzhan Vong thrust at her twice. Desharakor sidestepped one lunge, then batted the second aside. She pressed an attack, cutting twice at his head. The Yuzhan Vong retreated, drawing her forward, as he brought his amphistaff up to block the slashes. Reversing his amphistaff, he parried a lunge to his left, then reposted. Desharakor brushed his attack wide, then pivoted and extended her left leg in a kick that doubled the warrior over. Anakin smiled, then saw Desharakor stagger and collapse against the walkway. As she slid to the ground, her right arm left a dark, bloody streak on the wall. The amphistaff coiled at the feet of its warrior, then slithered up his leg and into his grip, a red tongue darting from its fanged mouth. It bit her when he reversed it. She's been poisoned. Anakin rose to his feet, fury racing through him. He summoned the force to himself, feeling it surge. He couldn't feel the Yuzhan Vong through it, but he could easily use it to collapse the walkway beneath his enemy, or shatter tiles into a jagged hail that would flinch the Yuzhan Vong alive. He could do hundreds of thousands of things that would leave the Yuzhan Vong shrieking in untold agonies. I can avenge Chewie, avenge Desharakor, avenge the people of Cernpadal. Right here, right now, starting with this one Yuzhan Vong warrior. He smiled coldly and nodded solemnly at his enemy. I can show him what a true Jedi can do. The Yuzhan Vong advanced almost casually. He spun his amphistaff as he came. He reached Desharakor's feet, and she moaned. He flicked a glance in her direction and slashed his amphistaff at her throat. In a heartbeat, Anakin realized that a true Jedi wasn't concerned with what he could do to the enemy, but what evil he could prevent the enemy from inflicting. Using the Force, he brought Desharakor's lightsaber up enough that it deflected the amphistaff strike. The Yuzhan Vong weapon buried itself in the balustrade, splitting tile with a thundercrack. The Yuzhan Vong had almost tugged his weapon free of the wall by the time Anakin reached him. The lightsaber's violet energy beam swept low, shredding a knee. As the Yuzhan Vong warrior began to fall, the Jedi brought his weapon up and around in a stroke that caught the invader between left shoulder and neck, angling down into his chest. The dead armor held for a second or two, then melted. The warrior slid lifeless off the blade. Anakin dropped to a knee beside Desharakor. Her green flesh had begun to take on a milky hue, and he did not think that was good. He flicked on his comlink. Team Twelve! One down! Copy, Twelve. Pull back to the Opal Grove and the Med Station. As ordered. Anakin thumbed his lightsaber off, then extinguished hers. He clipped her lightsaber to his belt, then hefted her up over his shoulder. Casting a glance behind himself and summoning the Force to strengthen him, Anakin carried Desharakor deeper into the Athorian city. I don't know if we can save it, but I hope we can save her. Triest Crefe turned from the holographic display of the battle when his shields officer called out to him. What is it, Commander? The cream-colored Bothan snarled. Port shield is down to five percent. The next shot will... Something slammed into the hull outside the bridge and shook the ship. Crefe, 
off balance from his turn, dropped to the decking. He gathered his hands beneath him and heaved himself up. Sharp ferroceramic shards fell from his body to litter the deck, and he noted that blood covered some of them. It took him a second to realize that whatever had hit his ship had managed to spall off the bulkhead's internal sheathing. Had I remained upright, he glanced toward the communications stations and saw what little was left of Lieutenant Arica twitching on the deck. Comms officer is down! Get someone on that station! Shields, what happened? Greatvo tore the right sleeve off his uniform and used it to staunch the wound on his forehead. Shield were low. A skip got through, hit us. It was just too powerful for us. Too powerful for us? Clife growled a quick laugh. Yes, that's it. That's the solution. Greatvo shook his head. Admiral? To the Yuzhan Vong defenses. Quifei looked at his gunnery officer. Give me a fifty percent boost on the power of splinter shots. It'll slow the rate of fire. I know, but they're putting up weak voids for our weak shots. Make the shift and we can sting them. Quifei turned toward the communications station. Give me Admiral Pelion. Borsk Felia nodded and wiped blood off the console with his sleeve. Call going in. Waiting for an answer. Thank you, cousin. Quifei crossed to the station. Are you certain you want to be here, given the danger you're in? The New Republic's leader nodded solemnly. Better to die here than waiting below for the Yuzhan Vong to find me. Quifei smiled and patted Felia on the shoulder. Do good work here, cousin, and there won't be any Yuzhan Vong left for you to fear. Shadao Shai moved through the jungle in the midst of his troops. Above him, the troop carriers, save for the one serving as his ground force command center, streaked skyward to carry reinforcements down to the planet. The grounded troops consisted of a dozen Chazrak for each Yuzhan Vong warrior. He'd broken his force into four components. One squad remained with his ship. He deployed triads on his left and right flanks knowing the trio of squads in each triad would be enough to delay any enemy they met. In the center he led an Ennead, with a triad at point, one in reserve, and the core triad with which he moved. He intended to conduct only a reconnaissance mission in force, because he knew he had too few troops to do much so soon. The villip on his left shoulder whispered in his ear, "'Master, we have reached the facility now.' You will want to see this. On my way. In his scout's voice, he had heard something that began to sap his resolve to only reconnoiter the enemy building. They had met no resistance in the planet, which allowed him to imagine the enemy would collapse when pressed. The battle for Dantooine showed that was not necessarily true, but Alagos had told him the Athorians were pacifists, if they lead things here. Shadao Shai cut through the ranks of his troops and began to run through the darkened rainforest. Though he knew his people controlled this section of the planet and that he was in no danger, he could not shake a sense of hostility. No, not hostility, just opposition. We are not wanted here. We are not hated but definitely not wanted. For the barest of moments, he entertained a flicker of doubt concerning the invasion. The gods had given them this mission because they were champions of life. Yet here was a world where he felt foreign, truly felt like an invader. He did not go so far as to wonder if the priests had lied, or if their mission was a mistake. Instead, he wondered if he was pursuing the gods' wishes in the proper manner, then decided that the uneasiness he felt was from means, not ends. He quickly found his forward force and crouched next to its leader. Report. We have movement there. The Yuzhan Vong warrior pointed at a sprawling white complex of ferrocrete. The building rose to three levels, 
with each stepped back from the one below. Towers rising from the uppermost floor provided ample advantage, and the muzzles of weapons seemed to bristle from walls and viewports. It is defended. We expected no less. It is defended by automatons. A tremor entered the warrior's voice. They have no respect for us. They dishonor us by letting their machines do their killing for them. Shadow Shai rose and stared defiantly at the white building before him. He pointed to it, allowing his tsaisi to slither into his hand and stiffen. They mock us. They mock our gods. Let us break their toys. Then they will have to come to us. And when they do, we will break them as well. Chapter 33 I copy. Thanks, Range Lead. Corin looked at the other half-dozen Jedi with him. You heard that. General Dendo says they have taken the bait. Gavin's flyby pinpointed the transport they're using as a command center. Saddle up. We're going in hot. Corin, clad as were the other Jedi in black combat suits, climbed aboard a speeder bike that had a brushed aluminum case strapped to the back of it. He punched the ignition button and felt the engine thrum to life. A small holographic image of the darkened jungle popped up between the handlebars, painting in luminous details the trees hidden by darkness. He smiled. Through the Force he could feel those trees and avoid them. This will just paint any Vong lurkers for me, as the thermal bleed from their bodies will betray their presence even if they are hiding. Corin looked around for a moment, then smiled at Jason, swathed in shadow. What are you looking at? The younger man pointed at the case. That case? Kinda hard to miss. It is, isn't it? Corin nodded confidently. But then, having it be noticed is the purpose of this exercise. Shadow Shai is going to find himself in a fight. And with this, we can remind him once again what he's fighting for. At Shadow Shai's order, the Yuzhan Vong Ennead surged forward, breaking from the jungle to sprint across open ground at the Athorian building. Red laser bolts began to burn out from the walls, with splinters of light streaking in every direction. Around Shadow Shai ran Chazrak, howling and barking. In their midst went Yuzhan Vong warriors, longer and leaner than their minions, racing forward in a sea of bobbing heads. The Yuzhan Vong leader stalked forward, seeing his troops as silhouettes in the light of the enemy fire. Energy darts exploded through Chazrak chests, clipped limbs, spun the diminutive warriors around to drop them smoking to the ground. Some of the wounded mewed and writhed. Others struggled to their feet to keep going. Shadow Shai did not waste the time to dispatch the seriously injured, instead granting them the grace of dying in pain to redeem their failure. Concentrated though the laser fire was, the automatons controlling the weapons lacked the flexibility to shift their tactics as the situation evolved. All the variables they were given to consider changed constantly, so each second brought new calculations and spastic motions imperfectly mimicking the living enemy they faced. Different machines responded at different speeds, causing them to leave one vector open while doubling up on another that no longer presented a threat. Slaves to their programming... The machines could not eliminate the extraneous and concentrate on what was vital. As a living creature has long evolved the capacity to do. Shadow Shai saw one of his warriors go down and reached his side in a heartbeat. He tore the amphistaff from the lifeless hands, began to whirl it over his head, then charged forward, letting his fury and outrage fuel his assault. Yuzhan Vong attack bugs filled the air around him. Some struck targets and exploded, crumbling walls, destroying computer-controlled gun mounts, and reducing automatons to shrapnel and sparking limbs. 
A living foe would continue fighting. But not these things. The Chazrak swarmed over the wall and raced up the ramps to the next level. From the roof towers, more laser fire poured down, though the guns failed to depress enough to rake the building's upper traces. Shadao Shai smiled grimly at that fact, since no living creature, no intelligent creature, would have made that mistake. A true warrior would hoist the weapons from their mounts and spray that lethal energy over us. These automatons are not even as intelligent as beasts. Well-thrown explosive bugs blasted the top of one tower off, sending a triumphant shout throughout the Yuzhan Vong host. The squeal of metal as amphistaffs were ripped from metal, and the snap of sparks as Kufi's sliced cables wove themselves into a percussive symphony of destruction. More explosions split the night, and a second tower crashed down with enough force to shake the whole building. Shadao Shai found himself shrieking victoriously with his Ennead, but his cry died prematurely. He stepped back, a cold sense of dread seizing him as Yuzhan Vong warriors and Chazrak flooded into the building. Something was not right, and not until he realized that the impact from so light a structure as the tower should not have been able to send more than a minor tremor through the building could he pinpoint what was wrong. This is not a permanent structure. He looked around again. His eyes widened with growing horror. An orgy of havoc surrounded him. Chazrak were beating consoles into debris. Circuit boards were yanked from their middles, rainbow ribbons trailing out like colorful intestines. Even his warriors appropriated wires and gaskets, adorning themselves with relics of the vanquished. His force had lost all its cohesion and discipline. The raising of the facility and the shattering of its technology continued deep inside, with shouts luring more and more of his troops into the white building's heart. It is what they wanted, what they expected when they put their abominations here. They knew we would take offense and lose our minds. Shadao Shai vaulted the low wall and began to back away from the building. He shouted for his troops to retreat and heard his call repeated. The Chazrak near him came away immediately, and more of their brethren began to flee. But none of the Yuzhan Vong warriors. No. Of course not. They would not take orders from Chazrak to leave off their sacred duty. He started to use his villip to get the command center to issue a recall. But a rumble began to build, shaking the ground. And Shadao Shai knew it was too late. The New Republic defenders, having long acknowledged that hitting a target was tough if there was no target decided to provide the Yuzhan Vong with something to attack on the surface of Ithor itself. They defended it with automated blasters, and peopled it with droid shells, cobbled together from spare parts, and just enough circuitry to allow the machines a little motion. They knew that using what appeared to be droids to defend the target would likely unhinge the Yuzhan Vong, and get them committed to a frenzy of destruction. Toward this end, they constructed a building rather hastily, not worrying about a lot of internal support structures or a deep foundation. Despite not providing a deep foundation to the building complex, the defenders did dig a hole beneath the building. This hole they filled with explosives, and then laid the building slab over the top. The detonators for the explosives were wired to one of the computers stored in the heart of the building. Once General Dendo armed it by a comm signal, the detonation sequence would begin only if the computer shut down. Having an amphistaff shoved into it and twisted accomplished this end rather nicely. The resulting explosion shattered the slab and filled the basement with fire, consuming a half-dozen Chazrak that had wandered down there. The expanding fireball then vaporized the next floor, taking with it the Yuzhan Vong warrior, his amphistaff, and the computer he'd destroyed. The blast cracked what few internal supports had been placed in the building, and as the fireball collapsed, the building collapsed in on top of it. Walls buckled, and the uppermost floor pancaked into the second one. The exterior walls cracked and sagged in, 
albeit unevenly, providing some room for survivors to hunker down. Smoke and dust poured out through broken viewports, with the wailings of the trapped and wounded following closely behind. Shadow Shai picked himself up off the ground and snarled. The villip on his left shoulder started chattering, but the whine of blaster bolts tearing through the jungle on his right flank alerted him to his immediate problem. The fact that he heard nothing from his left flank displeased him even more. He snapped an order into the villip, ordering a withdrawal, and began to stalk back through the night. How could I have allowed this to happen? His eyes tightened. Alagos! The Kamasi had been so open and peaceful, so intelligent and honest, that Shadow Shai had discounted the sort of cunning and guile such an ambush would require. They might have even anticipated what I thought of them, based on my contact with Alagos. The These people are not the Chazrak. Their conquest will not come easily. Shadow Shai let an angry howl split the night. It will come, though, and it will be at my hands. Mara heard Anakin's call, and the order he'd been given to head to the Opal Grove. She reached out with her senses and picked him up, then got flashes of trouble in the vicinity. She keyed her comlink. Jade moving to intercept twelve. Mara felt the force flood through her. She'd been waiting deep in the Jedi formation across the green strip from where Anakin had been stationed. The fighting on her side had not been fierce, so she'd not been asked to move up. As she raced along a walkway, then vaulted the balustrade to drop to the next level below, she found out why. The Yuzhan Vong had made a solid drive at the center of the Jedi formation. Kip Duran and Worth Skidder, both bleeding from numerous cuts, faced four of the warriors. Beyond them... Coming down the walkway, Anakin had stopped at the top of a small rise. He'd set Desharakor down, and with two lightsabers, was holding off a knot of the reptoids. The idiots should have called for help! Mara thumbed her lightsaber to life, splashing a cold blue glow over the Yuzhan Vong. She launched herself into a long, flying somersault, then ducked beneath the slash meant to open her from hip to hip. She stabbed her blade through the space between the Yuzhan Vong's legs, then cocked her wrist and stroked the blade against the back of his left knee. Tugging, she came up and through the limb, severing it completely. Snarling, the warrior began to go down. Mara leapt above the weak return slash, then came down with a heel hard on the fallen Yuzhan Vong's wrist. Bones crunched, and the amphistaff rolled free. Mara batted aside the warrior's other hand, scattering fingers, then stabbed her blade through his throat. Mara spun as Worth shrieked. The man reeled back, his right forearm bent where no elbow existed, and bent in a direction that no elbow could take. His lightsaber was nowhere to be seen. His Yuzhan Vong foe whirled the amphistaff, sending a hum through the air, and pressed his attack. With the flick of a finger... Mara sent a handful of dirt from a planter flying into the warrior's face. The Yuzhan Vong clawed at his eyes to clear them, giving Kip Duran a chance to slash him across the belly. That Yuzhan Vong warrior sighed all too peacefully as he collapsed. Another warrior arced his amphistaff at Mara, opening a cut in her left shoulder. Mara parried the return slash, then spun and kicked the warrior in the chest. He pitched back, then caught his heels on his dead comrade's body. As he went down, Mara disarmed him with a cut through the wrist, then stabbed him through the chest and melted his heart. Kip's violet and white blade swept up in a mighty cut that sliced through the Yuzhan Vong's chest from right hip to left shoulder. The Yuzhan Vong spun away from the blow and staggered several steps, clutching at his ruined middle. He held the cleaved breastplate closed as if that would save him, then sat back against a wall and slid to the ground in a pool of his own blood. Mara jabbed her lightsaber toward Worth. Get him out of here. I see blood. It's a compound fracture. Cauterize it with your lightsaber if you have to. Kip's eyes narrowed. He'll survive. I'm not going to leave you here. I don't need your help, Kip. He does. Just go on while there's still time. Do it. 
He stared at her through a mask of blood flowing from a scalp wound. I know my duty. Then do your duty toward your friend, she snarled as she ran toward Anakin. Get him clear! Up on the walkway, the twin lightsabers had allowed Anakin to hold off the reptoids. But the four of them were pressing him closely. Mara gathered the force to herself to make the leap up to his level. But before she could launch herself, one of the reptoids shifted his grip on the amphistaff and swung it around at waist height. His blow bisected his target. Then the reptoid lunged and caught the second of his comrades with a thrust to the chest. As the third looked on in amazement, Anakin lashed out with his purple blade, burning the surprise from that reptoid's face. A quick lunge with Desharacor's scarlet blade killed the last reptoid, who thrashed out his last moments of life at Mara's feet as she landed. What did you do, Anakin? Nothing. The boy smiled and looked past her. Mara spun and saw Luke standing there, all serene and calm in the midst of the chaos. The Jedi Master waved them toward him with a hand. Let's go. Anakin, you lead. Mara extinguished her lightsaber, then tossed Desharakor over her shoulders in an emergency carry. What did you do? She took great comfort in his presence. Swapped images of Anakin and the other reptoids in that one's mind. Wasn't much of a trick. But an effective one. She nodded. You saw Kip and Worth. Ahead of us. You can see the blood. Luke touched his hand to the middle of Mara's back. You should have called me to help. I figured you heard my calm and would come if needed. She laughed lightly so he'd know she was smiling. And I'm glad you did. Thanks for saving Anakin. I owed him. Her smile broadened as she saw Anakin warding a corridor entrance with his twin blades. Besides... A century from now, when Jedi are singing ballads about the great Jedi hero Anakin Solo, I want to be known for being a bit more than the woman he saved at Dantooine. Oh, I think, Mara, her husband said quietly, that won't be a problem at all. Aboard the Legacy of Torment, Dane Leon saw the weapons on one of the infidel ships flash. Their golden-red bolts lanced down at one of the smaller ships in the Yuzhan Vong formation and blew through the voids raised to intercept such weak shots. The energy projectiles boiled Yorick coral on the hull, converting it from solid to vapor, which jetted back out into space. Two shots that hit along the dorsal ridge exposed the living ship's main neural channel to the cold of space. Tissue froze instantly— imposing an icy block that prevented data from flowing to and from the bridge and the forward part of the ship. The Dovin basils there, being deprived of sensory data about incoming enemy fire, dropped into a standard wait state, positioning voids as best they could to protect themselves and the ship. Heavier shots poured down from the enemy ships. Some sank into the voids, but the rest punched past the defenses. They peppered the hull, walking in a line from prow to midship. Half-melted Yorick coral panels broke off and whirled free. The front half of the ship disintegrated under the barrage. Agony's child twisted in flight, snapping off the skeletal structure that had been its front half, and began to orbit Ithor as a new dead moon. What is happening? We had a strategy! Dean Leon watched as another ship came under a withering assault. It began to glow white and spread out like ice on a hot rock. That can't be happening! In an instant, Dane Leon knew what he had to do. He issued an order to all ships, commanding them to pull back to the daylight side of the world. He concentrated his own fire on the smaller enemy ships, discouraging pursuit, and slowly let the world's green disk eclipse the enemy force. Seething, Dane Leon pulled his head from the cognition hood. He knew this would happen. That is why he is down there. He did this on purpose. To shame me. The Yuzhan Vong nodded solemnly. And he sent for reinforcements. He'll not have them from me. I hope he is dead. If he isn't, 
I might just have to kill him myself. The Jedi Jungle Task Force hit the Yuzhan Vong command center hard. Jason triggered two shots from the speeder bike's blaster cannon. They struck a Yuzhan Vong warrior, spinning his headless body around and smashing it against the hull of the crate. Other blaster shots killed reptoids, though several Jedi dismounted to finish the last few with their lightsabers. Jason knew it was less because they wanted the kill than it was to prevent themselves from feeling so distant and insulated from the life they took. Corrin leapt from his speeder bike's seat and tugged the case free of its bindings. With his lightsaber unlit in his right hand, he ran to the crate. Jason followed close at his heels, and Ganner came right behind. Jason pounded up the landing ramp with his lightsaber at the ready, but found Corrin alone in the ship's interior, save for one cowering reptoid tucked down in a corner. The elder Jedi stood before a bank of villips and studied them. Most bore the likeness of a Yuzhan Vong, though Jason could not really tell them apart. A few of the villips slackened and smoothed as he watched, leading him to assume the Yuzhan Vong or villip paired with it was out of commission. How do you know which one to talk to? Corin had set the case down and had his left hand pressed to his mouth. I'm looking for one who looks important. Chances of shy being here are slender. But whoever is in command would have his... Well, whatever the Vong have that passes for ears. Jason shrugged. Sort on ugly? That might work. Corin smiled suddenly. It's a good day for our team. Can't forget that ugly face. He reached out and slapped a particular villip none too softly. Shadow Shai, this is Corin Horn. I own your command center, and it's my people harrying your flanks. You have some regular New Republic commandos on your right, and Nogri on your left. Bet the left is real quiet. The Yuzhan Vong villip visage hardened. You have less honor than an Undin. Corin glanced at Jason, but the young man shrugged. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound good. I might not have any honor, but I do have a packet of bones here. I think you wanted these. Their return does not mitigate your treachery. They haven't been returned yet, pal. I have a deal for you. You don't agree? I send these bones into the sun. The Yuzhan Vong's eyes became slits. Your deal is... What we both want. You, me, our seconds. The bones against Ithor. You win, you get the bones. I win, I get the planet. Corin's voice took on an edge. Our forces have a truce until we can fight this out. We each recover our dead. Then you and I settle this. You bargain like a merchant. The villip's lip curled into a sneer. A Lagos would have been ashamed at how low you've sunk. Well, you've taken care to see we won't ever know what he thought, haven't you? You and me, Shadow Shai. The bones against Ithor. How long until we meet? Corin hesitated for a moment. A lunar cycle. I'm a Jedi. I want to fight under a full moon. Remember the lesson of Cernpedal. I can make it so you will fight beneath a full moon. Two planetary cycles. There is a tabletop mountain west of here. We will do it there. Two weeks. Four days. Ten. I tire of this game, Jedi. Fury poured through the words. A week. No longer. Corin nodded. A week. The villip's face softened for a second, then sharpened. Seven planetary cycles from now. 
a truce until then. It shall be done. Good. Very good. I'll see you then. Yes, you shall. The villip's voice sank to a gravelly growl. Come prepared to die. Chapter 34 Admiral Pelion stood on the Chimera's bridge, his hands clasped behind his back. He stared at the hologram of his New Republic counterpart. Yes, Admiral Crefe, I agree that we got away better than I expected in all this. The Jedi truce is longer than I had hoped. I agree, Admiral, and we are putting the time to good use. The Bothan paced slowly the holocam panning to keep him in the center of the image. The modification we made to our gunnery seemed very effective, and took two of their smaller ships down quickly. I'm not certain how they will respond in the future, but by switching tactics in a battle, we can take advantage of their weaknesses. I have fleet tacks working on the modifications now. As do I, Pelion replied. You expect the Yuzhan Vong will not live up to this agreement if their fighter loses? That, or my cousin, will urge an immediate and full strike if Horn dies. This bargain has not proved popular here. Crefe scratched at his snowy throat. Regardless, we know we will face the Yuzhan Vong again. I have some new ideas, the files on which I am transmitting to you now. I have a ship in reserve to help us, if you think we should proceed. I'll review the files and let you know. Pelion gave his New Republic counterpart a nod. Do wish Horn the best for me. Were I forty years younger, I would offer to take his place. He will appreciate hearing that, sir. The Bothan flashed fangs in a smile. I don't think there's a person in the fleet that wouldn't say the same thing. Well, maybe one. But there is always an exception to the rule. Corin slowly screwed the butt cap onto his freshly recharged lightsaber. So, Chief Failure, I'm getting the impression you don't approve of my having made this deal with the Vong leader. For the 427th time, in fact. The Bothan stabbed a clawed finger at him. And I'll make the point a thousand times more if I need to. You had no right, no authority to usurp the New Republic's prerogative to make war with your stupid duel. I will make that point until you understand it and recant this bargain. The Jedi's green eyes hardened. Perhaps you need to understand something. I don't give a bucket of hot spit for what you think. I would remind you that because of your unwillingness to sanction the Jedi, I was recalled into the New Republic military. I made that deal under that authority. You were not the ranking officer on the ground. Actually, I was. General Dendo was wounded. But you didn't know that. Corin gave him a toothy grin. You telling me I couldn't have felt it through the Force? That brought the Bothan up short, but earned Corin a frown from the third person in the crowded cabin, Luke Skywalker. Corin, now is not the time to play such games with Chief Failure. You are correct, Master. No time for games at all. The Corellian Jedi glanced down at the lightsaber in his hand. Chief Failure, you've forgotten our history. Over a decade and a half ago, you forbade me to do something. I resigned from the New Republic military, as did the rest of Rogue Squadron, and we accomplished our goal anyway. So, consider this my resignation from the military again. Your authority over me ends now. Failure blinked his violet eyes, then glanced at Luke. Master Skywalker, order him to leave off from this duel. No. The Bothan's eyes became amethyst slits. The Jedi sanction this duel? Luke stared back. 
A week from now, I'm going down to Ithor to act as Corrin's second. So then, the Jedi claim the right to determine Ithor's fate. The sly tone in Felia's words sent a spark of anger through Corrin. He's right, Master. The Jedi can't be caught in that trap. I quit being a Jedi, too. You can't. Okay, fire me. Corrin frowned. Um, there are parts of the Jedi Code I don't buy into, and these robes chafe. There's insubordination for you. Ditch me. This is one trench run you don't need to make. The Jedi Master slowly shook his head. What you do not understand, Chief Felia, is that Corrin has acted to preserve life. Even if he falls, he is but one life lost against all those we are evacuating. One family will weep, not many. And when he wins, Ithor will be safe, and the Yuzhan Vong will know this invasion will not be without gross cost to them. Corin's flesh tightened as Luke spoke. Looking at Borsk Thalia, it became apparent that while the Bothan heard the words, their true meanings never penetrated his brain. He's off figuring how he will spin this, win or lose, to his advantage. Corin flipped his lightsaber around and offered the dark end to the Thalia. Here, take it. Go down and fight him yourself. No, I couldn't. I know that, Chief, and not because I think you're a coward. Corin shook his head slowly, then reversed the blade, leaving his thumb poised over the ignition button. This fight isn't your fight. It's mine. I'm suited to it, and since losing is not something I can do, I won't. The Bothan half snarled at him. If you fail, you will join Thrawn and Vader in the minds of the people. If I lose, Chief Failure, Ithor will be forgotten in the bloodbath that follows. Corin purged himself of anger and set his face in a calm mask. It is to prevent just that, which brings me to fight Shadow Shai. The preservation of life and freedom are the only reasons ever to fight. In their cause, I will win. Anakin shrugged his mother's hands off his shoulders as he stared through the medical bay's viewport. In the wardroom, covered with a white sheet to her throat, Desharakor lay on a bed, barely moving. He could tell she was still breathing, but her breaths came shallow and hurried. Leia spoke in a soft voice. You don't have to go in there. I don't want to, but I must. Anakin sniffed and nodded to his mother. She's... she asked for me. I have to. Do you want me to go with you? He swallowed hard against the lump choking him. No, I can do this. Just, um, I'll wait here. Thank you. Anakin brushed away a tear and entered the medical bay. Droids busied themselves with other patients. He moved over to the left side of the bed and rested his hand on Desharakor's hidden wrist. She started for a second, then opened her eyes. Her surprised expression changed into one of happiness, though it lingered for only a second or two. Weariness washed from her and Anakin could feel the spark of her life dimming. Anakin. Hi. How are you? Anakin squeezed his eyes shut for a moment. Stupid, stupid. Desharakor slipped her left hand from beneath his grip and the sheet, then brushed a tear from his cheek. It's okay. The venom... Anakin sniffed. Corin was bitten. They saved him... Human chemistry. Different from a Twi'lex. She lowered her hand and grabbed his, squeezing as hard as she could, which felt terribly weak to him. 
There is nothing they can do. I'm dying. No! Not fair! You can't! Anakin snarled as hot tears splashed down his cheeks. Not you! Not like... Chewbacca? Anakin's knees buckled, and he started to go down, but found a chair beneath his butt. He covered his face with his hands and felt Desharacor stroking his hair. I made a mistake, and he died. I made a mistake, and you are dying. There is no death. There is only the Force. He looked up through tear-blurred eyes. It still hurts. I know. She managed a weak smile. Anakin, you have to know, even though I am dying, I would not change things. Neither would Chewbacca. How can you say... She stroked his cheek, her fingers feeling cold against his skin. He died. I die. In service to life. You saved me from the darkness. I saved you. Not in recompense. But so you can continue serving life. The Force... He reached up and covered her hand with his. I will never be as good a servant as you were, Chewie. Desharakor smiled again, maintaining it though the corners of her mouth quivered. You already are, Anakin, and will be greater. As you heal, you will be stronger than anyone can imagine. We are proud of you. So proud. Her voice faded, along with her smile, as life drained from her. Anakin pressed her hand harder against his face, but found her touch fleeting and faint. As he watched, she became lighter, then translucent, and finally disappeared as the sheet that had covered her collapsed. Chapter 35 Luke Skywalker, enshrouded in his black cloak, stood silently at the southern edge of the mountain clearing. To the west, the mountain continued to soar. Its exposed granite seemed almost as if it were a long, solemn face, peering down on this flat greensward just below the level of its chin. Luke realized his own grim expression aped that of the mountain and he found no reason to change that. Toward the center of the clearing sat Corin, cross-legged, his back to his master. Peace and well-being radiated from him, with only tiny bits of anxiety leaking out from time to time. He wore his Jedi robes, green over black. His bare hands rested on his knees, and his shoulders rose and fell slightly with his breathing. So closely was Luke concentrating on Corin that Shadow Shai's appearance with his second surprised the Jedi Master. The Yuzhan Vong commander was nothing short of magnificent, clad in a sleeveless scarlet robe opened down the middle. Beneath it he wore boots and a gold loincloth with tails that reached knee level. His leathery gray-green flesh shone as if it had been polished, and a hardened mask of ebon inlay hid his face. He bore an amphistaff, which he stabbed tail-first into the ground. He raised a gauntleted hand, the dying sun glinting from his bracer, then pressed the hand back over his heart. I am Shadow Domain Shy. This is my subordinate, Dane Domain Lian. He will stand as witness to this combat. Corin remained seated. I am Corin Horn, late of the New Republic Armed Forces, a Jedi Knight. This is my master, Luke Skywalker. He will stand as witness to this combat. The Yuzhan Vong pointed at the case behind Luke. 
Those are the bones of Mange Domain Shai? As we agreed, yes, seven days ago. Very good. Shadao Shai shrugged his robe off. Though the Yuzhan Vong warrior was cadaverously slender, Luke could tell that did not translate into weakness. The warrior plucked the amphistaff from the ground, whirled it in a blurred circle, then snapped it to a stop against the back of his right arm, the hissing head at his wrist and the sharpened tail stabbing up into the blue sky. You are the murderer of Nira Shai and Drani Shai, my kinsmen. Corin stood, slowly and deliberately. Luke could feel the force gathering in him, swirling around him. And you murdered my friend, Alego Sakla. It is not over the past we fight, but to win the future. You, perhaps. The Yuzhan Vong drew himself up tall and straight, then bowed his head toward Corin. I fight for the honor of the Yuzhan Vong and Domain Shai. The Corellian returned the nod. So much risk for such a paltry gain. Amphistaff spun, and lightsaber rose. A slash blocked high, a low-cut burning grass, but not leaping legs. Combatants slipping past each other, turning, striking, blocking the amphistaff's hiss rivaling that of the lightsaber, weapons flashing forward, retreating, then reposting. Luke felt the force wreathing Corin. It strengthened him and quickened him, but could not predict for him what his enemy would do. The amphistaff cut and stabbed, always missing Corin by centimeters, or being parried aside. The Yuzhan Vong managed to whirl his amphistaff around in time to parry Corin's lunges, or to bat away slashes. They seemed, the two of them, to be perfectly matched. Defeat will come from a single mistake. The argent lightsaber whirled in a grand arc, then sliced in at Shadao Shai. The Yuzhan Vong warrior moved to block the cut, but Corin dipped the blade beneath the staff. He whipped his lightsaber up in a stroke that should have split the Yuzhan Vong from groin to throat, but Shadao Shai danced back leaving only the smoking tails of his loincloth fluttering to the ground in his wake. Corin closed and lunged at Shadao Shai's upper chest. With two hands on the amphistaff, the Yuzhan Vong parried the argent blade high, then ducked his head and whirled around in a circle. The amphistaff snapped straight against Shadao Shai's right forearm. Then he lunged. Pain exploded from the Jedi as the Amphistaff's tail stabbed deep into his guts. The tip tinted the back of the robe over Corin's right hip. Then the Yuzhan Vong yanked the Amphistaff free, spinning the Jedi to the ground. Corin curled around the holes in his right flank, drawing his knees up. His lightsaber lay smoking on the grass. Luke wanted to reach out, to help quell Corin's pain, but he held himself back. The Jedi Master drew some small comfort from the fact that the strike had not severed Corin's spine. Could have gotten arteries, and his guts are holed. But he could survive this if Shai gives him a chance. Shadao Shai drew back several steps, then tugged off his mask and tossed it aside. He raised the gore-streaked amphistaff to his lips and harvested incarnadine fluid with his tongue. His lips closed for a moment, his eyes following. Then he nodded. I vowed I would taste your blood as you die, and now I have done that. Corin coughed once, pain flaring through the force, then rolled up to his knees. Good for you, pal. Glad you're happy. He winced as he scooped up his lightsaber and staggered to his feet. Had I been in your boots, I would have vowed something else. Oh? The Yuzhan Vong's eyes opened a slit. And what would that have been? I'd have vowed to taste my blood after I was dead. 
All sense of pain vanished from the Jedi as the Force again enshrouded him. Corrin waved the invader forward with his bloody left hand. So, is this inability to make a clean kill a Vong thing? Or just a domain shy thing? You're so sloppy, those bones won't want to come home with you. Shadow Shai's eyes snapped open. Though Luke could not read him through the Force, the fury and hatred coursing through the Yuzhan Vong was unmistakable. The warrior darted forward, bringing the amphistaff up and around in a two-handed overhead blow. He smashed it down on Corrin's upraised lightsaber, driving the Jedi back a step. Again and again he rained the blows down with bone-jarring impact. Corrin retreated, giving up a step or two with each attack. As Shadow Shai's fury built, so did his strength, forcing Corrin to raise his left hand from the hole in his side to the hilt of his lightsaber. Another blow battered the silver blade, and another, buckling Corrin's legs, dropping him to his knees. Shadow Shai towered over him, rising up on his tiptoes to deliver that final blow. The amphistaff rose and crashed down, set to bash the lightsaber back into its wielder, slaying an infidel with the blasphemous weapon he embraced. With a flick of it, he killed the blade and sagged forward. Overbalanced because his weapon met no resistance, Shadow Shai buried his amphistaff deep in the ground and stumbled a half-step forward. The surprise registering on his face widened his eyes. Then his lips peeled back in a feral grin as Corin pressed his lightsaber against the Yuzhan Vong's stomach. The lightsaber hissed. Argent light poured from Shadow Shai's mouth, a second before, he vomited black blood and collapsed to the ground, his spine severed, his belly smoking. Luke ran to where Corin was dragging his legs from beneath the Yuzhan Vong's body. Stay down. I'll get you out of here. Wait! Corin clutched at Luke's shoulder. Help me up for a moment. The Jedi Master complied with the request. The Corellian Jedi pointed his lightsaber at Dane Leon. You witnessed this fight. You know our bargain. Take his body and go. The Yuzhan Vong waved Corin's comment aside. I witnessed, but I will not take his body. He died at your hands. He is no longer of the Yuzhan Vong. Dane Lian gestured uncaringly. His body is yours. Corin shook his head. I've no use for it. Then our business is concluded. The Yuzhan Vong spun on his heel and disappeared beyond the edge of the clearing. Luke started to turn Corin toward where they had landed their shuttle. Let's go. Wait, just a second. Corin pointed at the mask Shadow Shai had discarded. I want that mask. Why? Corin's eyes closed for a moment as pain washed over him. Alagos's bones. They're watching something. That mask will show him that the Vong are not invincible. And for Ithor, at least, there will be peace. Chapter 36 Upon his solitary return to the Legacy of Torment, Dane Lian assumed command of the Yuzhan Vong fleet. Appropriating Shadow Shai's suite, he immediately issued an order, the preparation for which he had begun over a month before, when he realized it was the most expedient way of dealing with Ithor. Shadow Shai had rejected it. But Dane Lian's other master had approved. From a dozen coral skipper sockets that had been refitted, launched twelve seed-shaped Yorick coral pods. While not nearly as sophisticated as a coral skipper, these unpiloted craft did possess a rudimentary intelligence. It enabled them to use the Dovin basils to lock onto Ithor's planetary mass and speed their descent into its gravity well. 
Their outer sheaths began to heat up and ablate as they entered the Athorian atmosphere. The twelve pods fanned out, streaking through the sky on courses that spread them all over the daylight side of the planet. In the Raal Roost's medical bay, Admiral Crefe turned away from where Corin Horn floated in a bacta tank, and raised his comlink to his mouth. Crefe here. Report. Sensors here, Admiral. The Rainbow reports a dozen gravitic anomalies from the Yuzhan Vong fleet. The Bothan officer growled. It looks like coral skipper traces, but they've gone into the atmosphere. Rainbow is reporting airbursts. Airbursts? I'm on my way to the bridge. Relay the data to the Chimera. The Admiral flicked off his comlink and turned to ask Luke Skywalker what he might make of such strange behavior. His question went unasked as the Jedi Master winced in pain and slumped against a bulkhead. The airbursts over the Mother Jungle vaporized each Yuzhan Vong's weapon's payload, expanding into a vast cloud. The aerosol droplets descended over the jungle in a fine mist. The bacteriological agents in the mist touched down unharmed. The jungle was to them what a herd of tauntauns would be to a hungry wampa ice creature. The bacteria began to metabolize everything and reproduce in an exponential progression. Black slime teeming with bacteria dripped from high leaves on down, streaming along branches. So quickly did the bacteria work that the fetid fluid seemed almost acidic. Branches fell, splattering the bacteria over other branches and onto arboreal creatures. A leather-winged shamarok flitter launched itself skyward, but black droplets on its wings quickly hold them, sending the beast circling down in a spiral of agony to crash on the ground. An arak snake slithered over and scooped the flitter up. Opening its jaws, the snake began to swallow the rare treat. But the bacteria went to work on it, too. As it devoured the flitter, the bacteria devoured it, opening ulcers in its flesh and consuming it from the inside out. The snake lashed out its life in a painful frenzy, then melted into a stinking pool of protoplasm that started in on the organic matter on the ground. That pool slowly spread as grasses wilted and flowed into fluid. Falling branches splashed more of the protoplasm about, creating colonies all around the parent puddle. As the branches themselves liquefied, they created enough protoplasm to let it flood out of the small depression on the ground, washing into the colony pools. In fits and starts, a black flood began coursing through Mother Jungle, gnawing at roots, toppling whole huge trees, then melting them almost before the echoes of their fall had died. Nothing that lived on Ithor could resist the bacteria. It soaked into the ground, destroying insects and other microbes. It coursed through wormholes and gushed into rodent warrens. Creatures taken unaware had a putrid wave wash over them, dissolving flesh, leaving bone, then cresting again to destroy the skeletons. The wave ate its way along roots, both up and down. Sometimes a plant that had a shallow root system would simply topple. Other times the bacteria attacking a sturdier plant would surge up through its circulatory system, devouring the core. Black sap would begin to drip here and there, staining the trunk. A steady trickle would start, and branches would fall, with protoplasm pouring free. Finally, a torrent of foul nectar would gush forth as the plant's bark split and the whole thing collapsed. The bacteria attacked relentlessly and fast. Its metabolism of the planet's life released a lot of hydrogen and oxygen. The planet's temperature began to rise. The oceans darkened, and a stinking shadow stole over the face of Ithor. In no time at all, on a human scale... The bacteria reached the place where Shadow Shai's lifeless body lay on the ground. His flesh resisted the bacteria for a moment or two, but the agent found egress through the wound Corin had opened in him. The bacteria ate into him, consuming him bone and sinew. His skeleton fell apart, then his bones cracked and oozed black as the marrow was devoured. Finally, 
the bacteria liquefied his skull, removing the last trace of his presence from the world his death was meant to save. Pelion stared hard at the holographic representation of Ithor. I agree, Admiral. They've done something. Oxygen, hydrogen, temp rising. If Skywalker is right, that all life is being devoured. The Imperial Admiral shivered, unable to conceive of ever using a weapon that could metabolize a planet. Commander Yaga looked up from her position at the sensor station. Admiral, the Yuzhong Vong fleet is moving. They're coming up on an outbound vector. Vector Alpha 7? The only one open to them. Pelion nodded at the small image of Crefe in the corner of the planetary scan. They're outbound Alpha 7. Time to move. Ithor cries for vengeance. Dane Leon smiled as he looked at the villip bearing his master's face. It is done, War Master Tsavang La. Shadow Shai is dead. The threat of Ithor is no more. I have the fleet moving out. Splendid. The villip's image smiled, making the War Master's face seem almost pleasant. You have done well, Leon. The legacy of torment is yours. When you get to Dubrillion, I shall have orders waiting for you. I understand, Master. Dane Leon nodded solemnly. This one awaits your pleasure. What was that? A jolt shook the legacy of torment, knocking the villip off its perch. Dane Leon reached for it. Then another, heavier tremor shook the ship. The Yuzhan Vong crashed to his knees. Something is wrong, very wrong. Ignoring the shouts from the villip on the floor, Dane Leon ran from the cabin and sprinted toward the bridge. In the week Corin's challenge won for the New Republic, Admirals Crefe and Pelion had not been idle. In studying the performance of Yuzhan Vong ships, both large and small, they had discovered a vulnerability they thought they could exploit. Snubfighter pilots had noticed that projecting voids cut into a skip's ability to maneuver. The two admirals wondered if the reverse would also not be true, especially in the case of the Yuzhan Vong capital ships. Toward this end, Quife had summoned the Karuska Rainbow from the fleet arrayed to defend Agamar, and had it jump in where one of Ithor's smaller moons hid it from the Yuzhan Vong fleet. As the Yuzhan Vong started to move out, the interdictor cruiser jumped into close orbit around Ithor and brought all four of its gravity well projectors online. That effectively doubled the mass of Ithor, steepening its gravity well and slowly beginning to suck the legacy of torment back toward the dying world. The Yuzhan Vong at the helm of the legacy immediately moved to counteract this effect. They brought more Dovin basils under helm control, reaching out to latch on to moons and the sun. They slowed the slide, then stopped it. They slowly began the climb back out onto the exit vector, and by the time Dane Leon reached the bridge, his ship was again on the move. Unfortunately for Dane Leon, the Legacy's crew, and even the living ship itself, the Karuska Rainbow had done more than jump in and power up its gravity well generators. Its gunnery officers computed firing solutions for the Yuzhan Vong Grand Cruiser. Their telemetry was fed to the main defender fleet. Every snub fighter boiling out of the ships, every cruiser, every star destroyer, used that data feed to provide targeting information for their proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. Barrage after barrage arced over the curve of Ithor's expanding atmosphere. They slammed into the voidless legacy, shattering Yorick coral plates. The energy released by their detonations incinerated neural tissue and boiled Dovin basils. The first wave completely disintegrated the aft hull, opening the ship to the void of space. Yet before air and crew could be sucked out, another wave hit, vaporizing more of the ship and igniting the vessel's atmosphere. Fire flashed into the legacy. Dane Leon knew a moment of agony 
as a fireball expanded into the bridge. He would have screamed, but the air was burned from his lungs before he could make a sound. For the half-second of clarity his mind possessed, he could hear Shadow Shai counseling him to embrace the pain, to make it part of himself, so he could know union with the gods. His last thought was to surrender to the pain, to allow it to consume him, denying himself the ultimate goal, because he could not bring himself to admit that Shadow Shai had shown him the one true way to reach it. The assault cracked the skeletal structure that held the legacy together. It broke into three parts, the most forward of which surged up away from the planet for a moment. The burning aft descended toward Ithor, picking up speed. The central piece hung in space for several seconds, then began its slow, tumbling fall to the planet. The prow, with its dying Dovin basils quitting one by one, likewise succumbed to Ithor's embrace. It really did not matter that the legacy was burning when it hit the planet's atmosphere. The friction from entry alone would have produced enough heat for the hull to ignite the oxygen-rich atmosphere. Fire flared out, quickly wreathing the planet. The superheated atmosphere expanded, flicking out little tendrils that bounced snubfighters around and buffeted the New Republic's fleet. One flare did reach out and caress a small Yuzhan Vaughn corvette, causing the ship to explode. But the rest of the ships had pulled far enough away to escape. The Yuzhan Vong fleet, what was left it, sped along its outbound vector and disappeared. Ithor, once a peaceful planet, blazed in their wake. With it burned the hopes of the New Republic. Chapter 37 Admiral Gilad Pelion paused at the landing ramp on his shuttle, turned, and shook Admiral Crefe's hand. As he did so, he felt a sense of profound loss. You do know, Admiral, that I wish things could have turned out differently. I found working with you fascinating, even enlightening. Imperial space will benefit from what I learned here. The Bothan nodded. I know that, Admiral, and share your feelings. I also know, despite what others might whisper, that you harbor no anti-alien bias. I have never felt anything but respect from you, and have nothing but respect and admiration for you. Thank you, Triest. The Imperial officer broke his grip and clasped his hands at the small of his back. Had we managed to defend Ithor, to save it, I am certain my people would not be recalling me. They are scared, of course. That weapon would have been tough to stop no matter what. I'm not sure having fleets orbiting worlds could prevent the Yuzhan Vong from doing that to any world they chose. But if I don't have the fleet at home, the civil population will panic. And we are as good as lost if that happens. We have, in microcosm, the problem you have in the New Republic. I only wish it were as simple a problem as that suggests. Crefe looked around the aft landing bay on the raw roost, and the knots of Athorian refugees huddled here and there. You don't have the best hope for the New Republic being blamed for the loss of Ithor. You don't have every little administrative sector deciding it has to defend itself. Ithor's destruction has sent terror storming through the government. Some people want to appease the Yuzhan Vong. Others want to fight them. And I have no doubt some would willingly ally with them if they were given the chance to destroy old enemies. Pelion nodded. In some ways, victory over the Empire was the worst thing that could have happened to the New Republic. Your hatred of us united you. Now forces seek to divide you for their own gain. You are fortunate, though, because your role in all this has been nothing but praised. The Bothan sighed. My cousin is being lauded for his brave action in the first encounter. 
He comes out looking like a hero. He finds it expedient to elevate me to his side, making him yet greater, which is what the people want. It's what they need. Heroes to believe in. I know, Gilad, and I would not deny them heroes, but I would rather they believed in you or the Jedi instead of someone who made the best of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Triest scratched his head. I feel sorriest for Corrin Horn. Pelion nodded slowly. Yes, the man who lost Ithor. Oh, then you've only seen the early news hollows. As the week has dragged on, he's become the man who killed Ithor. Someone had to take the blame. The Imperial Admiral smiled. You know, for the half hour between his victory and the planet's death, I was proud of what he did, the stand he took. He'd won the day and managed to save countless lives. Now it's all for nothing. Worse than nothing. The Jedi are being held up to ridicule. The military will have senatorial oversight. Priest smiled. Any chance Imperial space is recruiting? Pelion laughed aloud. And I was thinking I would ask you to save me a spot in that empire you'll carve out of the unknown regions. It would be my pleasure, sir. The Bothan flashed teeth in a friendly smile. I will keep you informed of how we are faring. I'd appreciate that, and will reciprocate. Pelion nodded, then looked at the other two men walking up to him. General Antilles, Colonel Fell, what have you decided? Jagged Fell clasped his hands at the small of his back. I'll be sending one of my squadrons back with you, sir. They will carry a report back to my father. I'll remain here with two squadrons, liaising with Rogue Squadron. I hope, sir, you understand my desire to stay here. Understand, yes. Respect and envy, even. Pelion offered the younger man his hand. They shook. Then Pelion shook Wedge Antilles' hand. This is not the last you shall see of me, my friends. Right now, my people are afraid of helping you. There will come a time when they are more afraid of not helping you. I will return then. I just hope it won't be too late. That is our hope as well. Triest Quife again shook Admiral Pelion's hand. May your course plots be easy, and your orbits safe. The same to you. Pelion nodded and started up the ramp. He looked back once, just to make sure he would remember them, because he was not certain at all that he would ever see them again. Then the landing ramp retracted, and his shuttle carried him home. Jaina still felt numb, sitting there in the Raal Roost's meditation cabin. Annie's death left a hole in her life, which both surprised and horrified Jaina. The surprise came from her having known the woman for only such a short time. Yes, we flew together and bunked together, but... Annie had liked to gamble, and no one in their right mind would gamble with a Jedi. So Jaina had found other things to do in her off time. When they were together, they did get along wonderfully, and she knew Annie liked her, and she'd liked Annie that they had become closer than Jaina had thought during her stint with Rogue Squadron shocked her. That she had not known more about Annie came as an even bigger surprise. Colonel Darklighter had said he was recording a message to go to Annie's family, and asked if Jaina would like to send one at the same time. It was then that she realized she didn't know Annie had a family. Annie had never talked about her life outside the squadron. And Jaina had been a bit close-mouthed about her own family life, assuming that Annie already knew as much about it as she would care to. She glanced at the data card in her hand. She'd sent off a message to Annie's family, and had quickly gotten a reply. The Holovid transmission captured on the data card had shown an older woman, clearly Annie's mother, eyes red from crying, 
doing her best not to break down. She told Jaina that Annie had enjoyed having her as a friend and wingmate, that Annie always talked about her in every message she'd sent home. Annie's mother added that she had sent some things of her daughter's that she wanted Jaina to have, and that she would like to meet her if Jaina ever made it to Corellia. I didn't know. I should have known. I... Jaina covered her eyes with her left hand. Tears leaked out between her fingers. A sense of guilt compounded the loss. Intellectually, she knew that there was nothing she could have done to save Annie. But that didn't stop her from feeling that she should have found a way to keep her friend alive. Now I know how Anakin feels about Chewie. She sniffed and straightened up, swiping at tears as the cabin door opened. She glanced at the silhouette and managed a weak smile. Did Mom send you? Anakin shrugged and sat down on the floor. I kind of nudged her into it. She knew you wanted to be alone. She didn't want you to be alone, but she didn't want you to think she thought you were too much of a kid to get through it. I hinted, and she suggested. You must have somewhere else you'd rather be. He shook his head. No. I wanted to talk to you. Figured this would be the best place. It's the only place I'm not underfoot. Jaina frowned. Plenty of Jedi here. Sure, but they're all wounded or caught up in what's going on with Corrin. A bunch of them, like Worth, wonder how it is I managed to kill Yuzhan Vong warriors without much more than a scratch, and they get hurt. He sighed. I make them doubt themselves, and they're not very good at controlling that idea. I can understand that, I guess. Not that they should take it out on you. She smiled at her little brother. Why did you want to be here? You lost a friend. I did, too. And Misery wanted company? He shook his head resolutely. Nope. I thought, well, look, when Desharakor died, she said some stuff that made me think. I thought maybe, well... Jaina softened her voice. What is it, Anakin? Well, she let me know, let me see that for her, it wasn't so... I mean, it was bad that she died, but she wasn't mad at me. His voice broke, and he smeared tears across his face with a hand. Your friend Annie had to know you were safe. She didn't die hating you. Annie can thank you, Jaina sniffed. I want to hope you're right. I just... I need to have my heart and my head and everything sort things out. Yeah... That seems like the hard part. He nodded slowly. I'm flying that same course myself. If you want to wing... Sorry. No, Anakin, that's okay. She reached out and tousled his hair. I'm glad you're willing to fly on my wing. We can do this together, little brother. I think that would work out just fine. Corin let the door to his tiny cabin slide shut behind him then leaned back against it. A little cough shook him, reigniting the pain in his abdomen. He'd already undergone two of the three Bacta treatments the M.D. droids had prescribed for his wounds, and had ample evidence that the Bacta had succeeded in helping his nerves to regenerate. He rested with his back against the door, less because of true fatigue than a reluctance to do what he had come to do. Threading his way through the Ral Roost's passageways, had been draining. Dodging groups of Ithorians in the narrow corridors made the journey hard. But it was not their physical presence alone that wore him down. Through the Force he could feel their anguish. After his wounding he'd slipped into a Jedi trance, and had been transferred immediately to a Bacta tank. He had been floating there, barely conscious, when the Yuzhan Vong attacked Ithor. He could feel life on the planet being extinguished as if something were blotting out all the stars in the sky one by one. He'd been out of the Bacta when the atmosphere ignited. The stunned shock of the Ral Roost's crew had hit him first. Then the flood of grief from the distant city ships slammed hard into him. The Mother Jungle, the living entity that had created the Athorians, that had nurtured and sustained them, 
the entity they loved and dedicated their lives to preserving, had been destroyed. From their ships they saw the atmosphere burn like a solar corona around the planet, leaving in its wake a charred, sterile cinder. That wave of horror and grief retreated, leaving every Athorian feeling as hollow inside as Corin had when... He glanced at the Yuzhan Vong shell lying on the bunk in the small cabin. He took one step toward it, then sank to his knees. He touched a finger to the latch creature, ignoring the sting of the needle as it drew his blood. The shell slowly opened. Bioluminescent tissue shed a pale green light that glowed softly from Alagos' bones. It danced a bit in the gems that replaced his eyes, but in no way conveyed any of the life Corin had seen in what they imitated. Alagos' skeleton peered down at him, and Corin fervently wished he could catch at least the hint of a smile there. The Jedi sank back on his heels and looked up into the jeweled eyes of what had once been his friend. From inside his robe he drew the mask Shadao Shai had worn. He rubbed his sleeve over its black surface, erasing a smudge, then reverently set it in Alego's lap. Your murderer is dead. Corin wanted to say more, but his throat closed, and the glowing image before him blurred. He covered his eyes with a hand, smearing tears against his cheeks, then swallowed hard. He wiped away more tears, then took a deep breath and set his shoulders. His death was supposed to save Ithor. It didn't. I know you'd be horrified to think I killed him for you. I didn't. I did it for Ithor. The gold skeleton stared down at him, cold mercilessness glinting from the gems in its eye sockets. Never any fooling you. Was there, my friend? Corin screwed his eyes shut against more tears, then opened them again. He looked away unable to stand Alego's dead gaze. That's what I told myself. It was for Ithor. That's what I told everyone. Managed to fool some of them. Most of them, I think. Not Master Skywalker. I think he knew the truth. But the chance to save Ithor had to be taken. He glanced down at his right hand and could again feel the weight of his lightsaber in it. I had myself convinced. I really did, until... There was a point in the fight. I'd turned my lightsaber off. Shadow Shai had overbalanced himself. His staff was buried in the turf. I shoved my lightsaber's hilt against his stomach. A shudder quaked through Corin. There was a moment there, a nanosecond. I hesitated not because I thought of life as sacred and that taking any life was horrible, the way you would have, my friend, no. No, I hesitated because I wanted Shadow Shai to know he was dead. I wanted him to know I knew he was dead. If he was going to see his life flash before his eyes, I wanted him to take a good look at it. I wanted him to have a nice long look at it. I wanted him to know it was all for nothing. Corin's right hand curled into a fist. He hammered it against his thigh to loosen it, then flexed his fingers as wide open and straight as he could. In that one moment, Alagos, I dishonored your sacrifice. I betrayed you. I betrayed the Jedi. I betrayed myself. Corin sighed. In that one moment I crossed the line. I walked on the dark side. He raised his head and met Alego's bejeweled stare. You Kamasi had a saying. If the wind no longer calls to you, it is time to see if you have forgotten your name. The problem I have, my friend, is that I heard the dark side calling to me. Without your help, without your guidance, I'm not sure how I can deal with that.
Jason Solo studied Corin Horn as the elder Jedi sat gathered into a tight ball in a chair. Bacta had healed the physical wound the Corellian had suffered, but a certain amount of psychic agony still poured from him. As far as Jason could see, Corin had done everything right, hadn't been out of control or acting like a rogue Jedi, and yet that was how he was being portrayed in the news reports about Ithor. Ganner paced impatiently. I just can't believe it. Corin puts his own life on the line, nearly dies to save Ithor, and has been transformed into yet another world-killing Jedi. Vader to Kip to Corin. I'm surprised they didn't build a link to Kamas in there. Luke pressed his hands together. People are giving in to their fear. They're not thinking clearly at all. We need calm. Calm isn't all we need, Master. You will need something more. Corin blinked slowly and looked up. You have to disassociate the Jedi from me. Ganner's surprise pulsed out. Abandon you? Corin nodded slowly. Borsk Falia has already managed to point out a number of things. I was not an officer in the New Republic Armed Forces when on my rogue mission to Ithor. He's noted my presence there was counter to Ithorian custom and law. He has made me complicit in desecrating Ithor, because I invited Shadow Shai to meet me there. Ganner frowned. I've seen one report that suggests you should have known that a fallen Yuzhan Vong leader is always immolated, so that by killing Shadow Shai there, you guaranteed the death of the world. Mara snorted disgustedly. That little bit of Vong cultural lore that's from that supposed holo journal of a Lagos Akla? The one he was supposed to have recorded while with the Vong, even though they would have smashed every bit of technology he took with him? The Jedi Master held a hand up. We know that is a fraud. Someone did it and is publishing it to make money. Jason snarled. And is making a bunch of it, too. That thing is selling wildly. It's because people are afraid. And morbidly curious. Ganner shook his head. There is no doubt about it. The death of Ithor is a serious shock. Dubrillian, Belkaden, even Cernpedal. Hardly anyone recognized those worlds. Ithor, on the other hand, is as well known as Coruscant. Corin sighed. And now is a sister world to Alderaan. Which takes us back to Uncle Luke's first point. People are giving in to their fear. We can't do that. If we abandon you, Corin, that's what the Jedi will be doing. The Corellian Jedi managed a weak smile. Thank you, Jason. But it's not really a question of giving in to the fear of others. It's a question of being overwhelmed by it. Master, you must repudiate me. Borsk Falia is looking to avert a disaster. He can do it only by laying the blame on someone else. Right now, he's playing off memories of Corrida and Alderaan. He's dropping the blame on the Jedi. You have to let it land on me. Luke shook his head adamantly. The Jedi are not going to abandon you to political maneuvering. Luke. Mara leaned toward her husband from her chair and rested a hand on his shoulder. I love you dearly, but this is a fight we can't win. Yes, we can, Mara. Okay, perhaps we can, but the effort we expend in doing it is going to detract from our ability to help people. She sighed. If we're waging public opinion wars, when we should be fighting the Yuzhan Vong, we will lose horribly. Right now, Borsk Falia has given us a way out of this mess, and that's to let Corin shoulder the blame for the loss of Ithor. All it will take is for you to issue a statement saying Corin's actions were undertaken without your consultation or consent. Luke's face closed up. That's not true. Corin sighed. From a certain point of view, it is. You had reservations all along about the duel. You had concerns over what fighting the duel would do to me. In fact, you noted many times that the Jedi are not warriors. 
Corin, I was your second in that fight. You chose to support me despite my errors, because the opportunity offered through the duel was one that protected many. A sense of resignation rolled off Luke Skywalker and surprised Jason. Uncle Luke, are you going to agree to this? The Jedi Master looked up. I can't fault their logic. I can. They're seeing that lies told by Borsk Failure and others are enough to destroy the reputation of a Jedi Knight. For the sake of making our lives a little easier, you're going to pitch Corrin aside. It isn't right. I won't stand for it. Yes, you will, Jason. Corrin nodded wearily. This is what has to be done. You're letting the ends justify the means. Jason blinked his eyes in amazement. Can't you see that? To save us some pain, you become as evil as Darth Vader or Thrawn. Jason, if you look at the short-term ends, that's how you can read it. I get hammered, but at least the Jedi won't. That means you are still free to do the jobs that need to be done. If I didn't do this, I'd deserve the reputation for being evil. Corin sighed heavily and unfolded himself from within the chair. With elbows planted on knees, he held his head in his hands. I'm not totally innocent here. Far from it. Some of the things Master Skywalker feared. Some of the things you feared, Jason, about vengeance and the dark side. They were true. I'm going to need time to sort them out. My being disowned, well, we get some good out of it. For the Jedi... For me. Concern washed over Luke's face and flooded his voice. Corin, whatever you need... I know, Master, thank you. I think, I hope, it's just time. Ganner scratched at the scar on the left side of his face. What will you do if you leave the Jedi? Corin shifted his shoulders uneasily. Well, Coruscant isn't home anymore. I have exchanged messages with Mirax. We'll return to Corellia. I can do things there. My grandfather still has enough pull with politicians that I can have asylum. Maybe Corellia can be motivated to do some positive things concerning the refugees created by the Vong. Worse comes to worst, and I hook up with Booster to use the errant venture to help out. He looked at Luke. You know... Despite problems I may be having, I'll be there if you need help. It's just right now, I think this is the best thing I can do for the Jedi all the way around. I think you're right, Corin. Luke reached up and patted Mara's hand. You're making a tough decision much easier. Jason just shook his head. He couldn't believe it. The Jedi had done exactly what they were supposed to do at Ithor. They had helped whisk refugees away, evacuating the entire planet. They opposed the Yuzhan Vong, putting themselves at risk to discourage the invaders. They'd suffered casualties and fatalities, and had even won a duel that should have guaranteed the safety of the world. Their efforts had prevented countless deaths, and yet enemy treachery and political manipulation resulted in a Jedi being blamed for a disaster he had done all he could to prevent. And my uncle is accepting that this is what must happen. Jason had long known that the heroic mold in which Luke and Corin had cast themselves as Jedi was not to his liking. It seemed a poor fit, and that fit worsened as the Jedi bowed to political considerations. If we serve life and the Force, how can we let politics turn one of us all of us away from that duty. We can't. There has to be another way. He sighed. I have to find that other way. Jason. The young Jedi straightened. Yes, Corin. You're idealistic. And that's good. I know this doesn't sit well with you. I can see that in your eyes. Yours too, Ganner. I appreciate that. But I need the both of you to do something for me. Something I can't do. Ganner nodded. Name it.
Corin looked at the both of them. And when his green-eyed gaze met Jason's eyes, the younger Jedi felt a jolt. Some Jedi, like Kip and Worth, will take my leaving as a good sign. They'll consider the sort of discussion we've had here just a display of weakness. When I leave, they'll think they've won some sort of victory. No persuasion on your part will change their minds. It will just lower you in their estimation. It will make their plays for power that much more effective. He glanced at Luke. You have to support Master Skywalker. If the Jedi aren't together in opposing the Vong, Ithor will just be one more tragedy in what's going to be a very long list. I'll do it. Ganner smiled. Thanks for providing me an example to follow. Don't follow it too closely, Ganner. Be yourself. Set an example for others. Corin shifted his gaze to Jason. What about you? Jason started to open his mouth, then closed it. Thoughts and emotions ran rampant through him. He wanted to agree, but it meant committing himself to a direction he wasn't certain was for him. A direction that will take me away from where I need to be. Yet, despite his ambivalence, he nodded. I'll do my best. I'm sure that will be more than enough. Corin straightened up, momentarily shaking off his weariness. I'm sorry to abandon you. My ability to help, there are things I have to do. I just hope you were able to handle the Vong. If there ever comes a time when folks look forward to the return of the man who killed Ithor, well, we know that means the invasion is completely out of hand and things are truly beyond saving. 